Hey, hey, this is Cedric, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Before we get into this no holds barred, raw and unfiltered conversation with Professor Dave Collum of Cornell University, I'm super excited to announce that the Bitcoin Matrix podcast is now brought to you by River Financial. Securely buy Bitcoin, zero fee dollar cost average, and purchase hosted mining rigs at river.com. I've been using River for the past two years because they are a client-first financial institution that is committed to guiding clients towards a secure, autonomous financial future. To get started, use the link in the show notes to get up to $10,000 free when you buy Bitcoin and miners at river.com. What if you didn't have to pay healthcare premiums anymore? What if you could invest in Bitcoin instead? Stop supporting the broken health insurance system with your hard-earned money. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use code MATRIX now and experience freedom from health insurance by utilizing Bitcoin. Right now, you can get your first six months for just $99 per month. That's just a fraction of high-deductible insurance plans. CrowdHealth is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for healthcare. This rip with the professor was way too much fun. So I hope that you guys enjoyed as much as I did. And now let's enter the Bitcoin matrix with Professor Dave, true disbeliever column on how literally nothing adds up anymore. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Dr. David B. Collum is a professor at the Cornell University. He received a Doctor of Philosophy from Columbia University in the city of New York. David's research interests are chemistry and chemical biology, physical organic chemistry, organolithium chemistry, organosodium chemistry, kinetics, and reaction mechanism. David Collum, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? I'm good. You're the first to go that deep into the chemistry story. Usually they just say, I got a chemist, stick their finger down their throat like there's a gag reflex, and then move forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, my smartest friend, one of the probably top five people I've ever met in life, He got into organic chemistry in college and uh, kind of seemed excruciating and he picked up things fairly quick, but for everyone else involved. And so just kind of looking at the different aspects of chemistry that you're involved in. And so I'd love to hear more about what your, you know, kind of your life as a professor, but maybe we could even dial it back a little bit and just like, how'd you get so heavily involved in chemistry? Uh, Especially I see that you you have a, a doctor of philosophy from Columbia University. That's basically a that's basically a science degree, though. So okay. I can go back ways because my my path. I actually think it's entertaining, but it's my path, so I'm probably hmm. self entertaining. But uh, but as a kid, I was a variable student, so I can remember key moments in my life where I sort of kicked it into gear, and then where I kicked it back out of gear, and I can give kids. Yeah, I got two. So I can remember, I remember this vividly one day. I was a typical boy, I think a bright boy who until third grade got just bees because that's what boys do, right? They're they're idiots and the girls are whipping their butts and every once in a while you get a smart boy and you go, boy, that's weird. And I, in the middle of third grade, I got a hundred on some spelling test or something. And I remember, I remember where I was sitting. I remember getting it. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I'm going to, going to try to see how well I can do. It never crossed my mind that that actually is a goal. And I I turned a straight B average into a 6A and 1B average in one quarter. Now, I can only imagine the parent-teacher conference where the teacher said, well, you know, it just clicked. Sometimes it does. By the time I got to third grade, I had an old bag of a teacher and I dropped down to four A's and three B's, which you're going, how do you remember this shit? I don't know. I really don't know. And then fifth grade, I had a lieutenant colonel in the Marines, a woman, and she inspired me. And I was back up into 
the A's and sixth grade A's. And then middle school's a blur, getting shit faced all the time, starting to smoke a lot of pot, stuff like that. Uh, not badly. I mean, not like a stoner, but, um, you know, drug, sex, rock and roll, a lot of sports, stuff like that. And then um, for some reason, I can remember all my grades. So I graduated, you know, I, I think it was like three, one, three, one, three, four as a junior. And then like a 4.2 as a senior, I realized I better show a curvature. Hmm. Um, I, I, I applied to Cornell cause I had family who went here and otherwise it would have been a completely absurd application. Cause I was, I was 86 in a class of 376. Again, I don't know why this shit sticks. And you don't get in with that. I've read admissions. You don't get in with that, period. I mean, I don't care what color you are almost. You don't get in with that. And um, and uh, and, and I, I, I got rejected early decision. My father said, I'll have your grandfather put in a word for you. He knows somebody there. And, and I got accepted. And about 20 years later, when he died, I found out that when I had been accepted, he was simultaneously vice chancellor of the Board of Regents of New York State, which is this state educational system and the president of the National Alumni Association. Hmm. So then all of a sudden I realized he controlled every penny into Cornell. And I realized, well, that's why you got in. Uh, I worked very hard in college. I gave up the pot. I joined a fraternity, but I worked pretty much every waking hour because I was way behind in terms of my ability to be a student. And I graduated from Cornell with a 3-4 GPA, so there's no genius there. The organic chemistry course, I got A's. One, I, I took a non-majors organic course because I thought I, I would suck, and I thought it would suck, and I liked it. And then the oddest thing, I, I, jumped, I jumped from that to the second semester graduate organic course, which was a near suicide mission. And I was 28 below the mean on the first test, didn't choke, just didn't know it. And... uh and then I got second highest grade in the class on the second test. And that's what, that's when I really lit up. I said, okay, I, I can beat these bastards. Hmm. And so I took some more grad courses and at the very last minute diverted from going to med school to going to the PhD program at Columbia, where the number one organic chemistry division in the world resided. And I ended up signing up with this young guy who was brand new, same year as me who I spotted, I spotted his talent, actually. I'm taking credit for that. Um, he was not just an assistant professor. And within two years, he was a complete rock star. A once every 20 year type of a person to come along, really a, just legendary. And uh, we got very lucky. A part of it was his genius, a part of it was hard work, but I ended up, um, I ended up finishing my PhD research before my second year of grad school was over. And most people do five years of grad school and two years of postdoc. And I got, I got offered an, an unsolicited interview from Cornell sort of at the beginning of my third year of grad school. And I seemed kind of nuts. And, but then I decided to apply for jobs because I was, I was on a roll. My PhD thesis was miracle on ice. It was, it was, it, if I had it, if I gave it another hundred shots at it, we wouldn't have done what we did. It was just one of those, you know, miss no shots in the second half kind of a game. And uh, I have got an unsolicited interview from Caltech, too. So, I mean, it was a surreal experience. So I ended up going back to Cornell. I, was, I guess I'd turned 25. Yeah. So two and a half year PhD. Again, Cornell second string. And here I was and I'm going, Hot, boy, this is surreal. I'm, I'm a, the most overrated assistant professor in the history of academics. And I decided to switch fields again. So I went, as an undergrad, I was a genetics major. As a grad student, I was a synthetic organic chemist. As a, as a, um, as a system professor, I started rolling over towards what's called physical organic organometallic chemistry, of which I didn't have any course in the subject matter. So, it, and, and I, it turns out physical organics fairly mathematical. And I didn't have any calculus, so that was sketchy. And uh, somehow survived. And, and I went into a very unconventional direction that people swore I would fail at, some with sympathy, some with schadenfreude. And it ended up working really well, because as you know, when you go in contrarian directions, sometimes they pay off handsomely and it paid off handsomely. So um, I'm not far from retiring, 
but it, it, I would say it worked well. Am I super famous? No, but I, I would say that, uh, I would say within the, within the field I chose, I think I'm, I think I'm arguably ranked number one. And, uh, and, uh, and so it, it did work well. And certainly what we do is unique. And what we do produces surprising results on a daily basis still. So that's how the surprises keep just coming. But anyway, so that's what got me into organic chemistry. I uh, got interested in markets in the 90s when I was a sort of a aging boom or starting to come of age. I started paying attention because the game was getting real. The, the tech bubble was building. Everyone was getting enthusiastic. And turns out in 87, after the market crash, I'd been all bonds from 80 to 87 which paid off well actually um the tech crash that the crash in 87 occurred one of my colleagues said you know dave you really ought to own stocks which i own none at that point so after the tech crash after the the 87 crash i moved into equities and i became a raging tech bull by the mid 90s and and that was kind of a sign that we must be in a bubble when i was a tech bull it just the time i thought i was a genius but i wasn't I started paying attention to market structure and market dynamics. And by late 98, well, July, it was around July 1 of 1998, I decided the markets were crazy. And I dumped half my equities. And that was almost to the day that we marched our way into the 98 crisis. And at the bottom, when the market had dropped from like, I don't know, 9,200 down to 60 something, I'm sitting there going, you're either a half genius or a half idiot. I'm not sure which, because you left half in the game and took half out. And I said, I'm going to get the rest out if it comes back. So by mid-99, I dumped everything else. And that included some treasures. Like I made 700% on WorldCom and sold it. Right? That uh, That's not genius. That's just pure luck. I did recognize the markets were screwed up, but I didn't know WorldCom was a complete scam. I thought it was brilliant. And I'd owned it for quite a while. And Dell computer, another 700%, 400% on Warner Lambert. Just everything was working because it was a bubble, right? Mm. Bubbles make us all look like geniuses. I went into cash and gold in 99. Now, I've had people say, well, that was easy because gold was real cheap. And I go, you know, and there's five of you in the world who think gold's a good idea. It's not easy, no matter how you cut it. And I don't even remember what allowed me to white knuckle through about a year and a half more of going down. But I was buying gold from 290 down to 270. I couldn't buy any more as it dropped. It came back. I had friends who went, went over 300 saying, you got to sell now, right? It's, it's over. I said, no, I'm not. So I've held the gold the whole way. So that was a good, that was a good run. Um, the other lucky thing wasn't complete luck, but it was pretty good luck. I decided inflation would be a problem. And around 2001, I started fishing for inflation hedges. And I talked to Jimmy Rogers' partner, the Rogers Raw Materials Fund, about buying into that because I wanted commodities and I didn't know how to do it. And I couldn't find a way to do it. You know, maybe at Wall Street guys could, but I didn't know how. And I decided that was too sketchy to any, it's just a derivatives portfolio and I'm not big on that. And I talked to the market maker in it too, and he didn't convince me. So instead I just went into a bunch of fidelity energy funds. And I rode those past the expiration date, probably in, to around 2015. But, but the, the knots for me were the most amazing decade because while the world was getting slaughtered, I was compounding 13% a year. And so, so that was by far my best decade graded on a curve. Right? So, you know, the nineties returned more, but, but, but no one made 13% a year in the knots. Right. Uh, the next decade I didn't believe would exist. I saw, I saw the crisis coming. I actually am on record of writing about it in 2002 and it's an email I sent to a friend of mine at Goldman who founded the software group, a guy named Rick Sherwin. And I laid out about five pages of why the subprime crisis, and it was demonstrably a subprime crisis brewing. And I, in the email said, look, I think GE and GM and all these companies are gonna go south. I think the banks are gonna go south. And, um, 
what I got wrong was I said, I thought JP Morgan would be ground zero and that was dead wrong. They, they were the survivor. Um, but the call was a good one. Um, and then, so it happened in 08, 09. Um, I knew enough market history by then to know that when you come crashing down from the stratosphere, a lot of damage gets done. So when we got down to the blows in 08, 09, um, I actually had some market neutralizing short positions using the Prudent Bear Fund just to neutralize some stuff that I didn't want to sell. And I liquidated those right near the bottom, but that I didn't think that was the bottom. I just decided that was a good run. I'm done. Um, I was convinced we had a long ways to go. And the reason was, is because if you look at the valuations in 08, 09, spring of 09, we were just really at fair value. A lot of people don't know that. They remember hurtling from, you know, like a Red Bull stunt where a guy jumps out of the balloon and hurdles to the earth. But but we we spent about a month below historical fair value. And and as a consequence, I said, I know events like this do much more damage. So this is going to be a dead cat bounce. I am not grabbing that falling knife. What I therefore failed to do was to to I, I failed to believe that the Fed could save it. Mm. And in the last 15 years since then, or a dozen years since then. I've yet to find a single person who knows a single person who anticipated the level of intervention. And so I don't feel like I made a mistake. Uh, it turned out to be a mistake, but I don't think the reason was bad because mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you remember, but when Bear Stearns went completely south um, and the Fed helped bail him out for 30 billion, that sucked the oxygen out of the room. And that seems like chump change, right? Yeah, That's something nothing. the Fed pulls out of the seat cushions right. now, right? It was huge then. It was huge. And the 700 billion was staggering. And now they throw trillions around, right? So, uh, so, so, so the fact that the Fed was able to save it with this, that level of intervention explains how I missed it. Uh, so while everyone else was in a roid rage from the bottom in 09 up to the present, I was doing 4% a year which is actually when I finally calculated, I said it was better than I thought even. Um, and then the question is, where do we go from here? Well, I am a firm believer that the market is thermodynamically driven and that it will keep trying to find equilibrium no matter what the Fed does. And I believe the market has so much unspent fuel in it and so much risk in it and so many so so many fragile connections that I do believe that um, that this is like someone who has cancer and, you know, you've been able to keep it in check, but it's stage four now. And at some point you say to your doc, well, what do we do? And the doc says, you know, get your affairs in order. And I think that's where the markets are now to scare people um, using valuations I calculated before, not now. I, I, I think we have a, a comfortable 50% correction from here and what could become an even more uncomfortable 70% correction from here. It'll be cheap at 70%. At 50%, it's fair value. Right. And for those who think that's not, I, I got to remind you, we've given up the gains from 2021. If you think you go on a roid rage like we went on and then give back a year and a half of gains, you're out of your gourd. I think I would have said similar things in 2008, 2009, though, as well. Um, that what? That we had way more room to go down than we did. Right. Well, we're fair value. So if, if you think the markets can come crashing down and then stop at fair value, that just his, history said that right. won't happen. But they saved it. They did save it. Yeah. For I that. just have a hard time envisioning this economy going through that kind of carnage right now. I think I, I do think that the sort of the, the destruction is needed in, in an organic sense. I think they're trying to destroy the de demand in an inorganic way. But I wonder how much if they can kick this down the can, you know, this can down the road another 15 years. If not, I mean, what kind what if markets went down 65%? I mean, what? How do you think that affects the the economy? What do you think of the economy right now? 
Well, I think the economy right now is a mess. Yeah. So I, I was on a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago. One of the guys on it was James Stack, who I the most deepest respect for. And he said something that I've totally disagreed with based on personal experience. He says, you can't see a bubble till after it's over. And the way he said it, it was a little ambiguous. And so I chimed in, I said, look, I got to take, take issue with what you said. I don't think you can see the structure of the bubble and what's inside it until it's over. But you, I think you can see the bubble. You just don't know what all the horrible connections are that are going to start tearing and ripping and shredding. Now, because the potential damage of a 50 or 60 or 70% correction from here could be awful, in no way means it won't happen, right? I agree 100%. And, and the awfulness in some sense, is the prerequisite to make it happen. So it's one of these things where, where if it happens, the market itself doesn't have the inherent stability to catch itself, then that is the problem, right? So it's the, it is all that fragility that you see breaking that is what makes it so dangerous, I think. Because if it was if it wasn't that expensive, you'd say, well, if it drops 20 percent, hell, I'm buying it. But I, I, I don't think things are cheap. No, I, I think things are way overvalued. The multiples are insane. But it, it seems at the same time, I mean, the levers of control are, you know, like you mentioned, I, I think I don't know if it was before the show or early in the show that you're close to retirement. Right. And, and if someone's close to retirement, you're thinking about like. I mean, these these are really pertinent issues. Uh, and if you you know if you're valuing your your assets on your balance sheet at a certain extent, maybe you can draw on those assets, leverage them. You it just gives you emotional comfort. Maybe like you're you're worth X, um, but you're not. You're not. But you're worth not. X. But I don't think most people think that though. Uh, right. At this point in the game, but especially. It's, that's the problem. Yeah. So they have they have illusory wealth, right? But do you think they they're going to let it happen? Like, in terms of levers of control, I think like there's a lot of. Uh, it seems like your generation has political power right now, and and. But how do you, how do you fix it? You print money. Not you know, fix up, it. You paper we're, through it. Uh, no, no, until... no. But we're we're staring at inflation right now. Yeah, yeah. For the first time in a long time. So then the question is, which is more dangerous, them getting a hold of inflation painfully or them showing the markets they have no intention of getting hold of inflation? Right. Which is worse, in your opinion? Oof. That's uh, a good question, isn't it? It's a really good question. I'm glad I don't have to figure that one out. Well, you do, though. In terms of? Well, I presume you have investments. Yeah, but I in that in that regard, yes, I have to figure out what my bet is, but I have a long time horizon, so I can even afford to be wrong to some extent. No, I can make up ground. Ne not necessarily. Not afford to be wrong, but if I was no, wrong, no, I'm, I mean really not necessarily. If you were a Nikkei investor and money in the market, thirty yeah. years later, you're you're still underwater. Can you afford thirty years? Uh, probably not. Right. Yeah. And it, you know. it turns out I drew um I took a plot of the inflation adjusted S and P equivalent goes back to the turn of the century. And I the the information I like to do look at when 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 I'm looking at the performance of a stock, so let's say you're at a market peak in 1929. Everyone always says, Well, when did we break even? And someone will say, Well, 1954. The question I like to ask is when did the market last hit that that 29 peak? before it finally pulled away from the gravitational field. Okay. And the answer was 1991. No, 1981, sorry, 1981. There, there are four periods in the 20th century where you can find a peak, draw a horizontal line across the inflation adjusted S&P and hit that exact same price as a bottom. And those four lines are 45 to 75 years long. No one can withstand that. No. And so then the question is, what do you do? If you were invested in the market in 67, you treaded water for 14 years, inflation unadjusted, inflation adjusted, you lost 70%. It's not the 70%, it's the 14 years. 
So I, if you, I, I'm not sure if you were still in a thought there. Um, we were talking about inflation. Well, I was just talking about how, how markets can be um, can go nowhere for decades. I this agree idea. With that. Well, the last forty. What years, I meant by me, I can me, survive that though. I, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, go ahead. Uh, it was just that in terms of uh, even if my assets didn't go anywhere for thirty, I would still be working, and I would still be able to like I'm not living off my assets. So, and, and I do think that there's to some extent since your generation has a lot of political control. And I think there's a lot of politicization of these of these asset classes uh, through monetary policy that they're going to want to defend sort of those asset values as long as they can through whatever mechanisms they can. Whether it's successful or not, I think remains to be seen. But well, that's the point, though. Yeah, that is the question, right? Yeah. This is your your oncologist wants to save your life too, right? Uh, I think my oncologist killed my dad, but like. Well, my dad's on right. Just kill, well, you know. well, there's a good metaphor um, for the Fed. They yeah. might kill the patient too, right? What do you think their goal is here? I mean, do you, like, is it to defeat inflation? Is it to win back power from Davos and and the euro and Europe? Is it is is this a battle with China? Uh, is is it about all markets? of the above? All of all, the above. Um. Let's go with the simplest model first, that the Fed is just there to keep markets elevated and try to keep inflation in check and somehow balance that. And I think that the inflation has appeared finally. And I think you can actually make arguments for why it finally appeared and things like that. I think I think the, the, the lockdown was a trigger, but not a cause. So I think the lockdown was the spark. And once it took off, then it was a raging inferno. And I think they're going to have trouble getting control of it. And, and my my favorite way of asking is, let's say you are a contractor and you're going to build a house two years from now. What would you add to the cost of labor and materials on a bid? And and as soon as you realize that you're going to add 10% a year for two years or whatever, that's when inflation has gotten into the DNA. Right. And I just saw a story today about a, a labor union that turned down a new contract. And the story was so goddamn stupid. It didn't mention what the new contract was going to be. I read it thinking, okay, tell me what the raises were going to be, you know, this, and they didn't mention it, but I'm, I'm guessing they're holding out for a lot of money. Right. Yeah. And there's a worker shortage, but, but it's not, it's not a, people like to say, this is a, this is a strong labor market. No, it's a broken labor market. It's not strong at all. It's a disaster. Yeah. It, it's it's broken to the extent that uh, the buyers and sellers of the labor um, can't seem to come to terms with the price. So the laborers don't want to work and the buyers don't want to pay. And so we've got a shortage. It seems like the laborers have disappeared. Well, that's the mystery of mysteries, which I've, I don't think I've touched a podcast in the last year that hasn't touched this topic. And it, it's probably the sum of many contributions. But, but nowhere I, is like, I haven't gone anywhere where they have too much labor. Everywhere no. is short labor. Mm -hmm. um, where'd they go? Where'd they go? I'm really, yeah, I'm perplexed. I, I get, you know, how they can disappear from the official numbers. But I just don't know yeah. where they've gone in society, and because I everywhere I go at the same time, there's a shortage of labor. There's some where I'm been going lately. This doesn't seem like there's any shortage of of customers or demand, and maybe not right. everywhere is bumping, but maybe they weren't bumping before. But everywhere that's doing whatever they were doing before is doing that now, maybe plus ten or twenty percent. And you um, can see it clearly because you're in a store or something, and there's no one in sight. You, you can't get someone to answer a question. You go right. to a restaurant, they can't get the waitresses, they can't get the cooks, they can't get. And whenever you ask, they say, oh, they work somewhere else. And I've not found this mysterious employer of all people. Right. Um, it could be the sum total of so many things that 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 no one item stands out. Like it could be could be some died. It could be some says, screw this. I've I sat on my deck and I liked it and I'm done. And so they've retired. And so instead of retiring at 68, they've retired at 66. But that's a chunk of labor if they do that, right? Right. But I, I see everyone who's easing out, you know, whether it's uh, their 
partner or spouse works or whatever it is and they're going to live without that or they're going to run that's right you know or maybe they're doing some sort of cash job on the side but it seems like overall everyone is skimming doing without somewhere Mm -hmm. and yet prices on every front are are going up and including all the necessities and basics so i just the math just seems absurd well, yeah. the labor could come back fast. So if you take another 20% mm-hmm. off the boomers' wealth, you can see the boomers reappear in the workforce. Yeah, I mean, but there's not a lot of high-paying jobs out there, right? You know, in terms of... Yeah, if, I don't know how people are putting food on the table. I don't know how they're putting food on the table. I don't know how the the average bloke who's not, you know... Yeah, I don't, know how, I don't know how everything's not ripping apart at the seams. Right. Um, I, I don't either. No, I no, mean, I was, you're, you're... I was just up on Long Island, this, you know, out east on Long Island, and I couldn't get amazed of how much decadence I'm still seeing. Back is sore. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, it wasn't that I was at decadent places, but I, I you could just see it from the car, from, you know, whatever boat I was on. And it, everything is still going at the highest octane. Um, well, they say that they say the consumer credit is people are slow to correct their lifestyle for starters. Yeah. So if all of a sudden you're buying 10 percent less with what is an otherwise unchanged salary, it is not easy to find that 10 percent right away. So for a while, you delude yourself and your credit card starts building up charges and stuff. And so, uh, and so I think, I think there's a stickiness to lifestyle that does not go away for a while until all of a sudden it's like, holy shit, uh, we really do have to cut back on the spending. Yeah. And, um, and, and that, that day of reckoning may be coming. And then, um, uh, I had dinner with a friend one night who shall remain nameless, but I can guarantee you if, if I gave his name, you'd know him. And, um, everyone would know him. And he's, he thinks that, uh, a lot of labor went back South of the border and didn't come back. Now you hear about all these Biden, um, Biden, uh, you know, refugees, uh, you know, coming across the border and say, well, why aren't they doing it? Well, it's possible that the disruption to the labor management relationship. So let's say you have a gardener that's been working for you illegally for you know many years. It's possible that connection's not being made yet. Something along those lines. So the the broken workforce, I was talking to a trucker today. I like to talk to people who have this sort of ground level view of economics. And he said, I asked him about availability of neon because of the use of neon for microchips, the fact that it all comes from Russia. And he said, oh, yeah, we're having a terrible time sourcing neon. He was from air gas. And uh, but then he said, we're having trouble sourcing everything. It's just the whole thing's still screwed up. And so uh, and so then the question is, you know, what, what does that mean? I don't know. It's mysterious. Yeah. I mean, you bring up China there and. And, and labor, I think, you know, is, is that cheap labor gone forever uh, coming out? Well, of, you so know, that, of- that's. So so there's a there's a big picture bearishness, which I've cobbled together from several sources. Uh, some credit goes to Murray Stahl of Horizon Connects and others just kind of I add to it. Um, Murray said years ago. In the early 1980s, Russia was collapsing. The Soviet Union was collapsing. It hadn't. It took another handful of years, but it w- was collapsing. They were desperate for capital, and so they flooded the world with resources. He said simultaneously, China was com- coming out of the dark ages, and uh, and they were starved for capital. How starved were they for capital? I read a different article that said when, oh God, who the hell was it? Dao Xing or someone, I can't keep the name straight. He was invited to the United Nations when China was just coming out of its its completely opaque period. And they only had 38,000 of foreign reserves in their banking system, $38,000. That's how broke they were. 
So they flooded the market for the next four decades with cheap labor. Mm. So those are both very disinflationary. Meanwhile, in, in the United States, at least, and I'm not as up to speed with Western Europe, but on the United States, the boomer demographic was just hitting the workforce. And you can't find a single economist who doesn't buy the idea that demographics drives economy. So when your economy is young and everyone's starting to really you know, put the pedal to the metal, they're all, it's all work, no play, you crank. Now we've got a very aged economy. And, and the story is even worse than that. There's a guy named Peter Zihan, who's a former Stratfor analyst. Stratfor is this private intelligence agency for those who don't know. So it's like CIA guys on better paychecks. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a demographer. He said, he said the population is collapsing all over the world. Now, a lot of people don't know that. So the replacement rate in the US, you've always heard 2.2 is ZPG, right? That's what we used to hear because our goal is to get it down to 2.2, right? When the Club of Rome was warning us. And turns out US is something like 1.7 now. China is something like 1.3. And the thing about demographics is the key part of this demographic story, they've already been born. You can't change it. So, so this, this population problem is this ship has sailed. Right. And apparently every country in the world has got one. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe this guy is pretty compelling. Then the other day, just out of coincidence, I watched Elon Musk, who's become way more entertaining now. Hmm. Um, he, um, he was asked, what's the most important problem humanity faces? And you could have imagined a million answers, but he said the collapse of population. Mm -hmm. I go, holy shit, Elon got the memo on that one, apparently. And they laughed. He said, no, I'm not kidding. He said the population is collapsing. Now, here's where it gets dicey. And I don't know if this part's right, but if it is, it's a problem. Um, Zion's model is that the collapsing population is going to rip apart globalization at the seams. The, the, the connectivity between countries. And I, I, I never, I read his book. I, I didn't quite understand why that had to be. What I can tell you is we're now in a war with Russia. Mm -hmm. Globalization looks pretty bad. We got Saudi Arabia saying, screw you. We're not necessarily selling you oil anymore. So yeah. the biggest militaristic bully on the blocks now getting pissed on by, by former friends and I must say, you know, when Trump ran for president, um, it was him or Hillary. And I hated Hillary so passionately. I'm going, I'm going to have to vote for him, I think. But I was nervous. But what made me, what really made the difference for me is he said, we have to get along with the Russians. That was his platform. And, uh, and, and, and I agreed. And then they push him in this whole Russia story and every chance we've gotten, we push Russia and, 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 and now we're not getting along with the Russians at all. And so there's that. And then on top of that, you know, women had entered the workforce and that seems to be tailing off again. Mm. And, and our interest rates in 1981 went from 16 down to essentially zero over the next four decades. So of all those tailwinds, they're all gone. So if somehow you think the next four decades will be just like the last four decades. I don't think so. So then in terms of the next four, I mean, where does China fit into this? Uh, I was really struck with that situation at their big conference or Congress where they escorted out the former uh, prime minister. But we don't know what that means, do we? It was no, just creepy. Which, which is, it's it creepy just... to me. It's very, it, it reminded me and a lot of other people on the internet of what happened with Saddam Hussein and, and sort of exactly there to me, it was a Except public he, humiliation. It did not. He seem literally Saddam literally decimated his, his, his uh, political allies. Supposedly he literally took about one in 10 out of the audience and those guys all died. I'm positive. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Xi, Xi Jinping just took out the one guy, but it was creepy. It was very creepy. It was. Yeah. But and, and I think that it. got out. For, I mean, you know, that that was in their biggest moment, per se. They don't let anything get out that's not curated, the, it seems. They showed that on purpose. Yes. 
Uh, it seemed like they were playing a card. Um, Just like or, when co- when COVID started, they were showing videos of people killing over in the street and getting welded in their apartments and stuff like that. That all looked fake to me. Yeah, I mean, that I can still diagnose. Staged. I didn't think it was fake in the beginning. I mean, I was alarmed by. Well, I it. thought the virus was real. I thought the, the virus the videos was alarming. Looked wrong. The videos looked bad. Even if they, I, I still bought it. I think at first it still got my nerves going. Um, I noticed that they disappeared. Um, right. I still don't know what to make of it from head to tail. Um, right. I don't know if we'll ever, you know, kind of get there, which kind of brings me up to, you know, I, 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 I got through a lot of, uh, the 2021 year in review, it's 319 pages, I think. Is that, that right? Is that thing? Something like that. When you print it, I mean, it's really ginormous. Um, <laughs> it was painful, but it was great. Um, but there's some great themes in there and this is from a year ago. Uh, and I think they've just. I don't think I saw these things as clearly as a year ago. So revisiting this work was really interesting. So what do you make of the growing intellectual and philosophical divide? You know, between just, who and who? Just in in uh, in conversation everywhere, uh, ideology, so, the way we approach things. Um, I mean, I ask your scientists. Uh, right. You know, um, just the, even just. Uh, I wonder, and and I think also because you're on a, uh, you've been on a, a university campus for thirty ish years, forty something, forty two, forty two years. Uh, I kind of wonder what the ebbs and flows have been like there, and but you don't see it as much as people think. So people have this image, like if they uh, walk through the campus, it would just it would be like they'd walked into a nightmare or something, some Bruegel painting uh, or something. I right? went to college. That it, wasn't a nightmare for me. No, I know, but it was some time back. But it, it, kids are still just walking around campus, going to class. There's, the, I think the most disturbing thing for me, uh, well, definitely uh, as a loose cannon, um, the students look much riskier to me now. So I can have a class of kids, and before, I would just have a ball. I would just, you know, talk like crazy and tell stories. Would you say like you mean more it. PC, more like, well, you never know when one's going to get up. No, you, well, both. You never know when one's going to blow up on you and go, go to some Dean and bitch about you. Right. Now they can't get me. They've tried several times, but they shouldn't be trying to get me. I mean, that that's the crazy part. What is that part, like to have people trying to get you? Well, it depends on the level they were trying to get me. Um, my problems, be- I never had any trouble. My problems began in 06-ish when I was asked by the dean of faculty to play a central role in an anti-union, to, to, to form an anti-union movement because they're trying to unionize the grad students. And it's just, it's just a bad idea. It's it, There are places where unions work well and places they don't. Grad students is a bad place, in my opinion. So I played a, an important, but... It, it, it didn't make a difference role. The UAW tried to unionize the grad students. They lost, period, and, the, and we won. In um, ah, 2017, I think, well, around 2015, the American Federation of Teachers showed up. And that was more dangerous because I, I knew that the world had changed. I knew that the students' attitudes had changed. And I was seeing no opposition. So I sent an email off to my dean and provost and said, I'm not seeing any opposition. What the hell's going on? These guys are on campus again. This is going to be a big one. And that night I got a call from the the provost and he said, I need you to set up an anti-union movement again. So the next day I had a conference call with Cornell Legal and I could hear there were lawyers in the room. I don't know how many, but I could hear there was more than one. They said, it's our understanding, you beat the UAW. And I said, no, that's not true at all. They did is lost on the ideas. It got openly debated, blah, blah, blah. I, um, so I put together a group, same thing, second verse, same as the first, but the union had figured out the mistake they made. So they stopped engaging. What's this like? Well, this is like when Fetterman won't, it won't, won't debate Dr. Oz or when Hobbs won't debate Kerry Lake. They just went into freeze mode. And they did all their campaigning behind the scenes. They have an army of students to work with. And I realized we're going to lose. I, and I told Cornell Legal, I said, look, if the NLRB is not, if, if you're not getting charges filed against me at the NLRB, I'm going to be disappointed. Cornell said, we're fine. We're fine. 
go for it. Let her rip. No, no breaks. And they were. So I sent out an email and they complained, but it was a legitimate email to, to faculty, around 350 department heads and leaders. And I got nothing. I got crickets. And right close to the vote, I sent out another email. I said, you know, shake the buildings empty. You got to get the vote out. We're going to lose this. It's going to forever change Cornell. And some idiot in the union posted on social media and it blew up. But what it did is it brought the debate into public view. And then I did a carefully done interview with the Cornell Daily Sun did a smear interview. And I, ha I normally don't do interviews on a podcast because it's all there. An interview, they'll parse out parts mm -hmm. and make me look like a complete asshole instead of a partial asshole. And, um, and I, I normally don't do it, but I got this call this night saying we want to do a, an interview. So I had to call an audible and I did it. And uh, and they were clearly going to hammer me the next day. And and at the very end of the interview, I said, I'm not done. And she says, oh, what else you want to say? I said, no, that's that's a quotable quote. I'm not done. And she put it. She took the bait and she put it in the article. It was fighting words. I'm saying I'm coming back at you. Right. So it got openly debated. And uh, and out of 2000 votes, the anti unions won by 60 votes. It was a hairline call. And it turns out the, the organizers, this is a multi-million dollar unionization effort. It would, it would bring in over a million dollars a year of dues for the AFT. This was big stakes. And this would be one of the very first across the country, right? So this was a big game. The day before the vote, um, Chuck Schumer showed up with Randy Weingarten, who we all have learned to hate. Um, as head of the American Federation of Teachers, Cornell ILR grad, this is a stronghold here. Um, and she gave us a rally speech, but at the very end, she says, I don't want to get political, but then she proceeded to hammer me. So I'm sitting there going, you know, I hurt you. I hurt you. You would have shut your mouth if I hadn't hurt you. And so then they lost. About a week later, seven union organizers had gone through my Twitter feed. And you can imagine how ugly that got. And they lied their asses off. They, you know, I made a joke that was, you, you know, the movie um, Hangover, mm -hmm. right? It's hysterical, yeah. right? So a friend of mine was going to Vegas. I said, don't forget the roofies. They said I was promoting rape, right? This, these are serious accusations, right? Yeah. So they did a bunch mm. of stuff like that. And they didn't get me, but it felt bad. They didn't get me. Um, then... And there was something so strange here. And there, it's, there's a message here that I still haven't quite figured out. Remember when the guy got knocked over in Buffalo and smacked his head, uh, the old man, when yeah. the police knocked him over? Yeah. That night, Chris Irons of QTR um, posted that and said, this is just awful. And I watched the video a couple of times. I said, Chris, I, we're supposed to do a podcast on Saturday. I said, you know, we can talk about this on Saturday, but I, but I, I got to disagree um, why was he poking the cops as a war zone? It looks kind of self-inflicted me. I didn't say he deserved it or anything. I just said, it looks self -inflicted. It is. You go poking a riot police, you get whacked. You, you're a stupid ass. You're a dumb ass, right? And uh, he turned out to also be a grifter. So the whole thing was faked. The whole injury was faked. Everything was faked. I was eventually able to prove it. There were videos of him talking about going to get punched by the cops. The whole thing was a setup. But they someone fired off a cancel movement and it came so quickly and so furiously in such volume that it had to have been locked and loaded. It wasn't a grassroots movement. And so, and it turned out it pivoted around a, a Hollywood guy with like 2 million followers. I haven't been able to figure out his connection to it, but he posted a tweet 20 minutes later, he took it down. And by morning there were 5,000 signatures to get me fired. And so something, and this is 1130 at night, right? This, this is just, so I think cancel culture is an astroturfing mechanism that has been created by opponents either of the right or of the United States. I'm not sure which, but there was something so precise about it. Within a half an hour of the thing unleashing on me, I got an email from a group called Fire, which is a bunch of lawyers who defend free speech saying, we see you're in trouble. If you need our help, give us a yell. Within a half an hour of the thing starting. So the, the, just and, and email boxes across the campus were filled up that night.
And so that was some sort of real sneak attack. Someone, someone blew the dog whistle and said, go for him. And I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know the details. Cancel culture is an attack on free speech. And it's not that what I said needs to be attacked. What the goal of cancel culture is, in my opinion, is an attempt to scare people into thinking twice about saying anything controversial. And that then gets to the very heart of free speech. So if, like there was a, 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 a dean of a nursing school who very carefully said in the middle of the Black Lives Matter, George Floyd shit, very carefully said, look, you know, blah, 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 blah. She carefully went out. She said, all lives do matter to us. And she got fired. So, so, so although cancel culture seems to have died down, the chilling effect is not. Everyone's aware that a slip up can be the end of you. Now, I'm ready. I'm not done yet, as I said. So now I'm 67, planning on retiring maybe around 70. If I have to retire today, I'll be fine. And so if they go at me again, I'm going absolutely balls to the wall if Cornell doesn't back me and stand up. I'm going public. I'm going to end up on Tucker fucker Carlson. You know, I, I, there's, there's, there's no chance I'm going anything but you pig fuckers. And it's going to be, and, and if I don't get, I, I made the national press on mine, but, and I didn't want to really make the national press, but I also kind of didn't want to not make the national press because I got paid a high fucking price. And um, so this one, I will go batshit. I will declare war. And maybe I shouldn't say this because someone's out there saying, okay, let's do it. Hmm. So maybe I'm asking for trouble. When I was being canceled, I slept with shotguns and put knives in every room. I was ready to slice throats and blow off heads. And it was one of these, look, you might come for me, but I'm not going out alone. Because the Antifa guys were still running around doing bad shit. There was no way to know if they'd show up at my house. And I was emotionally prepared to blow their fucking heads off. And I, I can get back there. And it just, it's one of these, you know, if I have, end up doing it, I'm doing it for the team. I'm taking one for the team. And they'll pull up this podcast. We'll say there's the evidence was premeditated. No, it's self-defense. Right. So, um, I don't know. So that's how, that's how they came for me. I do believe that the Cornell kids think they can't get to me. I think they've decided that there, it turns out my mm. wife is can't, there's a million reasons why firing me would have been harder than just normal, which include not only that I was canceled using, they used the dirt from the, the union shit. So the dirt they dug up to hammer me for the union shit, that's the dirt they used to cancel me. But don't forget, I was asked personally by the provost to fight that fight. That would not look good in court. Right. My brother-in-law's a trustee, good friends with David Einhorn, trustee. I happen to be the only guy at Cornell who's on speaking terms with the former president of Microsoft, Microsoft Windows, to be precise. There's just my grandfather was president of the Alumni Association. My wife is Candace Cornell. I coach two sports as a, as a professor. I, I, I'm the only guy to be director of undergraduate, graduate studies, associate chair and chair in the department, period, the only one. Um, so so I would be hard to fire without the, without the court going, you know, you, my, my, pro, my dean presented my record of funding to the trustees as a case study in funding. I mean, there's just, there's just reasons why yeah. that I'd be tough to touch. And so if Cornell... Cornell didn't turn on me either. So they were just trying to get out of a mess, right? They were trying to find a way to end it. They kind of turned on me by denouncing what I said without actually saying what I said. Mm -hmm. Because for one thing, they also knew that if you looked at what I said, you'd go, that really was nothing. Right. And, uh, and so I think um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that would have protected me too. I have plenty of time to think about it. I can tell you that. So, mm. so, so they come after, they, they like trophy hunting. Mm. The guy who handled it the best, the best was Dave Chappelle mm -hmm. who said, uh, who said, look, I'll happily talk to you, but you will not summon me. I will not take a knee. 
that was just brilliant. I don't know who a speechwriter is, but but that was brilliant. That was, and that's you never apologize. You never apologize. They feed on the apology. They feed on the blood and the water. And so I just shut the fuck up during the 2020 cancellation. I just laid low. I was getting little tiny tidbits of uh, of information from uh, um, from my current chair, the guy who used to be my associate chair when I was chair. I was getting little tiny tidbits about what was going on at the administration, trying to put out the flames. And they put out the flames, so I can't complain, even though they denounced me, including the chief of fucking police at Cornell. Now wrap your brain around the fact that I got canceled for supporting the cops. Right. And the, the latter denouncing me is signed by the chief of police at Cornell. Right. But that's their way of saying, you know, we're the good guys. Don't come at us. You know, they don't need anti-cop sentiment on campus in the middle of the George Floyd riots. Right. And so I totally forgave their response. And I've had people tell me it was awful. And I said, no, it, it put out the fire. It, it, it worked. It, it did what it was meant to do. And it was maybe tasteless, but um, maybe it was cowardly, but it, it did. It achieved the goal. Yeah. So, well, you know, this made me think of a lot of things here, uh, specifically around the growing intellectual and philosophical divide. Uh, I feel like a lot of these events, the, 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 the Kyle Rittenhouse, the George Floyd, the school shootings, uh, the, the Coving Covington English, kids, the Covington, Covington kids. kids, all these things. They're, they're these purse, these, these perfect, uh rubik's cubes uh for both sides to viciously fight over and to mm -hmm. and and to uh do witch hunts on uh it, and, so it feels premeditated right it feels, it feels premeditated orchestrated. they get spun yep. up they get spun up it seems like these are selected to me it, it they don't feel happenstance they don't feel organic in the i'm not saying they're not real i'm just saying they they feel Have that you like, wondered if roe v wade was timed for a reason I mean, I think know I never. Uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking about it now. I've thought about Planned Parenthood, I get, but I don't know where you're no, going. No, but but think say. about the fact that the Democrats were completely and utterly on the rocks, mm. and then all of a sudden, in this big election year, which I think they're going to get crushed, unless of course the election is rigged, which I think it is. Um, but I still think they're going to get crushed, um, and they should get crushed because they've been pretty bad, actually. Um, how, how do but, we go from like? It might be rigged to it could be crushed. They could get crushed. And, I I, and I think you decide when to punt the ball. So you rig it. You rig it if if it's you know third and long. If it's fourth and long, you punt. Right. Uh, okay. And I, I don't. Sorry to cut you off there. I, I didn't mean. No, to. that's fine. I'll talk forever. No, I'm ready to go. Um, let me turn to so. I would say, oh, the reason I think that was so jarring about what happened in in that Congress in China was he got it was a public execution in terms of it was a public That's cancellation. Right. Mm -hmm. It was cancel culture at the highest possible level. That's right. That's and, right. And, and but it is witnessing. China. It is China. It is China. Sure. But I mean, is China? Di I mean, I think China is different today than it was 30 years ago in terms of uh, we might be seeing people talking about this guy like he's an emperor, and I. Oh yeah, they're way more powerful than they were when they they last had an emperor. So, I, and I I don't know what that means for global geopolitics. Um, well, so here's where it gets complicated. So, um, if you read about the history of China coming out of its dark period, um, what you find out is that. Um, is that China approached the U.S., not vice versa. So Mao had decided that it was time to come out. And so he approached us. In fact, there's some very funny politics in the U.S. where people were trying to position to get credit for this. And they had to pull John Kerry back and shit like that. There was all sorts of crazy shit that happened. But, but Mao set up what he calls the 100-year plan. In fact, the book written by Michael Pillsbury is called The 100-Year Marathon. Now, when was the last time a U.S. leader set up a 100-year plan? But Mao set up a 100-year plan and said, we're going to get our GDP up to here by this year, and we're going to get to here by this year, et cetera, et cetera. So it looks like it is a century-long plan to become a dynasty again. 
And so you sit there and you go, well, and they're right on schedule. Now, here's the funny thing. Go back to Peter Zion. Zion thinks China is going to collapse within 10 years. A lot of people. And, and well, that could be a chaotic world, too. Yeah. yeah. It'd be a chaotic world. And so, um, so then the question becomes who's right? Because no one else seems to say that. And so who's right, Zion or the rest of the world? And I, again, I'm not as, Zion is, um, I think he's good on the data and uh, overly ambitious and confident on the predictions. And so he says China will collapse within 10 years. I go, not 12, you know, not 15, not 20, because things take a while. You know, he, he, he puts some hard numbers on his guesses. And I think there's a kind of a arrogant self-confidence there that doesn't make sense to me. He's also a bit of a neocon. Right. So and then so, you, uh, do you think a figure like Z is part of that 100-year plan or he sort of usurped power? I, I, it seems to me what happened is China was progressing. Um, but then as they got more powerful, the urge to grab control reappeared. Right. So I think they were releasing they were releasing um, civil liberties to the populace very slowly. And along comes Tiananmen Square, right? Not long after the Soviet Union fell apart. And I understood what I thought the Chinese did. They were saying, look, dudes, we're making progress. You're not going to all of a sudden tip over the system now. They jailed a bunch of people. They shot a bunch of guys. They said, you're asking for it too fast, too furious. You're not getting it. And uh, and it, I've talked to Chinese Colleagues, they said, you know, that's not a bad thesis. That's that's not crazy. But then Xi Jinping seemed to have grabbed it, right? So once there's power worth grabbing, someone's going to try to grab it, especially in a country that has a history of someone grabbing power. Right. I always wonder, do you think he fears one day having happened to him what he did, maybe I'm presuming did to the former prime minister? Well, you know, there's that age of emperors in ancient Rome where they went through 50 and 50 years. So if he doesn't fear that, then he's he's more clueless than I think he is. Right. Right. I couldn't he's imagine. Always, he's, how could you not fear that? Right. I don't right. know. I'm not sure the word fear is the word, though. Sure. I mean, these arrogant guys say uh, they have no trouble thinking they, they are the kings of the universe, I think. So. Right. Well, so I that might be the death of them. But what do you think of Putin? So Putin's an interesting story. I'm going to be, I'm actually writing about it right now. It's, it's, it's by far the focal point of this year's year in review. And I'm structuring it in this very strange way. Part of it's because when the trouble started, um, I was one of the guys who had to go look at a map and see where Ukraine is, right? <laughs> we None of us could pick it off the, the map, right? Um, but it, but but there is a way to go to look at what the hell is happening. And so the way I'm structuring it is is kind of how it started, events along the way that troubled me. And I'm taking um I'm taking a pro-Putin angle. I'm steel manning Putin. And part of the reason is is because I have read enough. So what I eventually did is I went pre drums of war period, which goes back from 2020 day back to pre-2014. And it turns out that um, it is not hard at all to build a case that NATO fucked with Putin every chance they got. And that Putin was trying to play it straight and NATO just kept fucking him over and over and over. And so when the Berlin Wall collapsed, when the Soviet Union collapsed and Germany was reuniting, which had everyone a little nervous, right? A big Germany has, has gotten into trouble more than once in our history, right? So, 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 and the Russians were obviously nervous because they'd lost 20 million people to Germany not too many decades earlier. Um, and so uh, Putin basically agreed to say, look, uh, I mean, uh, Russia basically agreed to say, look, we'll let the Warsaw Pact go, but you don't absorb these countries into NATO, don't push east. And there's all sorts of documentation on this. There's all sorts of documents that show various key players like James Baker's up promising things. And we reneged on everyone. 
on every single one. So now we're sitting there looking at a country on Russia's southern border where Putin said, look, you simply can't have Ukraine. They didn't want Ukraine, but they didn't want NATO to have Ukraine. And it's not so different than missiles in Cuba or if they put troops in Mexico. And you can say, well, Putin doesn't have that right. I said, you know, I, I don't really care. Sovereign states' needs and <laughs> rights don't always overlap. But the critical thing is when sovereign states get together, they got to try to figure out each other's needs and find a way to coexist. They, they have to do that. That was the I voted for Trump because he said we got to get along with the Russians. And so what happened was over the years is we kept stiffing Putin. We just kept sticking it to him. And he turns out to be, if you dig into his history, he's a by the book guy. Turns out that some of the delays that people were saying was Russia fucking up. It was Putin doing it legally by Russia law legally. And then before the war started, before the war started, it was almost comical because the U.S. was saying, you know, Putin's going to do this. Putin's going to do that. And Putin's going, what the fuck are you talking about? Zelensky is saying, would you please show us the evidence? Because we're not seeing it. You got British prime ministers or second in command, whatever, saying, we don't think anything's going to happen here. But the Biden administration is banging away hard. It's very, very clear to me that NATO wanted the war. They want to use Ukrainian bodies to give Russia holy hell. And I can't for the life of me understand why we have to give Russia holy hell. I can't for the life of me understand why we don't want Putin in power. Russia has been unbelievably predictable and well-behaved mm. during Putin's reign compared to previous, previous heads of Russia. I mean, maybe Gorbachev was better. But Putin has kept, you know, Justin Trudeau is not going to run Russia. It's not like you can run Russia with a with a wimp. Maybe they want chaos in Russia. Or... Well, but that's not our fault then. See, this is exactly right. So a simplistic view. Uh, there's so many layers to every onion that I always think, OK, I'm at layer 10, but the truth might be a layer 27. Um, you could make a simplistic argument that the U.S. wants to grab the resources in Russia. That the mm -hmm. NATO countries want to go charging into Russia. We put a guy in place who we who who's a pawn. By the way, the U.S. does not support democracy. Uh, it, 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 U.S. in no way, shape, or we tolerate it where it exists, and we can get rid of it. But show me a country where we actually supported democracy instead of installed some dictator who did what we wanted. We have done it all through South America. We've done it all through the Middle East. We put dictators, ruthless, slaughtering dictators in charge as long as they do what we want them to do. And you can say that means we're evil. Well, you could also say that if you look at the history of the world, that's just the way the world's always been. Right? It's not like there are cupcakes in the past. Read Steven Pinker's book. It's been just nothing but brutality through the history of the world. Right. And so um, so I think NATO basically and, – and so the guys you want to watch. So, so I, I found the people who are willing to take Putin's side and look at it from Putin's side. And <laughs> besides a few rogues who wander in and out of the plot line. There's about a half a dozen, maybe 10 guys who have been banging the drum relentlessly. And these are guys like John Mearsheimer is the most prominent. Uh, recently, Jeffrey Sachs has jumped into mm -hmm. it. Um, I sent Jeff an email and said, Jeff, I just wanted you to know that uh, you're doing a great job on both the COVID story and, and the Ukraine story. He's very happy to hear about it. I mean, he, he, he's really fighting. Uh, you got uh, Scott Ritter, who's a very contentious looking character, but I think he's telling the truth. Steve Walt. Um, 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 you got the rogue journalists like Greenwald and guys like that who are trying to tell the story. You got some real rogue journalists like Gonzalo Lira and stuff like that. So you find the guys who are willing to bring up the other side of the story. And what you discover very quickly, and, and also you go pre-2022, so if you read anything mm -hmm. since the war started, it's just complete garbage. It's right. utter. For example, I would challenge anyone to say, do you know who's winning the war? Do you have any mm -hmm. idea who's winning the war? Yeah, it's a, it's and, a, a war, a fog, <laughs> a fog of war. 
yeah, it's complete fog. So, so here's the thing that really altered my thinking a lot pretty quickly is early, early, early on when it really hadn't even started. And it started slowly. Do you remember the first footage? You're seeing, you know, Ukrainian women blubbering over something awful, but you don't see the awful. It's not saving Private Ryan. It's not right. Baghdad getting crushed. It's Russian soldiers talking to Ukrainians. It's burned out cars like you'd see in Detroit. It's, it's buildings missing chunks from them, like you'd see in Detroit. There are explosions in the middle of the road where it hit nothing and barely blew up the road. There's, it, it, it's just, you're going, this is just a rough night in, in Chicago. And, um, and so it started slowly, but what happens? It picked up speed. But Ritter said something that really, sorry, I, I, I think okay. I'm, I think I have COVID. I'm not joking, actually. Um, yeah, Ritter said something that stuck with me early, early on. He says, Russia is not going to fight an urban war. Russia is going to sucker the forces of Ukraine to defend the cities. And then he's going to go around. Them. And and lo and behold, you'll see Russia heading for Kiev, which, by the way, no one seems to know how to spell. Just like Zelensky, just like just like is it Ukraine or the Ukraine, right? There's just mm -hmm. so many things no one knows how to do. And um, and what happened is that um, so so Russia would make a a, a move toward you, Kiev. The, the 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 Ukrainian forces would mount a ferocious counterattack, and then Russia would back out, and 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 the Western press would say, oh, you know, they're defeating the Russians. And they're not defeating the Russians. They might be defeating the Russians. Ritter might be a communist spy. I don't know. Oh, there's also a guy named Richard Black and Douglas McGregor, for those who are keeping track. If you want to go start looking up YouTubes, all these names are worth watching. And uh, McGregor, who was White House level advisor, military advisor, said that at one point when they're talking about the huge carnage against the Russians, he said, I think they probably lost about 500 guys. He was mm. really telling a different story. Right. Um, Mearsheimer for a dozen years now has been saying that NATO is pushing us to World War III. He's been giving the talk to anyone who will listen. He says NATO is pushing us to World War III. I mean, that, that it does seem, I mean, I get the that angle. <laughs> Where I get really cloudy is pre-Ukraine, the Putin story that I was hearing, and it was really loud, I think, especially around 2016, 2017, 2018, but it was, you know, he was, you know, K former KGB pawn, pawn, basically, or just, uh, you know, run a little guy right. there, but also maybe mafia-linked, uh, mayor of St. Well, Petersburg, that, Port City. That's, that's Russia. Sure, that's Russia. Great. That's just Russia. Uh, then he comes to power. And he, mm -hmm. it seems like he then uh, subdues all the oligarchs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, he had that famous uh, the trial where the, the the wealthiest oligarch was put in a cage in the courtroom. I think. Okay, and, let me tell you how Putin. So I binge watched everything Putin. I've been watching Putin for probably a half a dozen years at least. Just thinking that the guy's impressive. And I watch him get interviewed. And what I notice is, first of all, the claim that he he's nuts and a madman is psychotic. He, he I did a Twitter poll and put it said, who's who's a better leader for their country? And I gave Trudeau, Biden, uh, 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 Boris Johnson and Putin. And Putin got like 80 percent of the vote. Putin is not insane. Uh, Putin is not a madman. He might be ruthless, but he's not a madman. When he gets interviewed and he answers questions, no leader is as direct as him. You do not in any way I've get a sense that, yeah. that he's ducking the question. And when he was asked about the oligarchs, he said they robbed the country blind. And you go, enough said. That's, an, that's a straightforward answer. So now, if you want to read about how they robbed the country blind, you read Bill Browder's book, which I think is half truth and half lies. Hmm. But Bill Browder's book talks about in detail the mechanism by which the Soviet Union, as it broke up, they distributed chits to everybody 
to share the wealth and said, okay, here you get your, you get your X chits that represent wealth and buy what you want with them. And it turns out that because the place was such a shit show that people basically had to sell their chits for nothing to eat. And so aggregators ran around and collected up the chits and then sold those chits to the oligarchs. And these guys were just buying up Russia. Right. And so Putin was dead right. Now, does he assassinate people? Of course he does. Do we assassinate people? Of course we do. I'm reading a book on the CIA right now. Not a, not a flattering one. And uh, I, what, what makes me mad turns out to be what I call the sanctimony industrial complex. So there's the people who think this is just a story of good and evil. I got, it's not a story of good and evil. This is a border war in the Baltics. Could there be anything more complicated than that? Right? This is an unbelievable mess. This is be like a tribal war in the Middle East. You would have no understanding of what was happening. And, and so people say, well, by definition, Putin's the evil one because he, he attacked. And so I said, okay, let me, let me first start with this. Which country bombed more countries and killed more people in the last 20 years, the United States or Russia. And we own that by at least an order of magnitude. Madeleine Albright admitted we killed 500,000 kids in Iraq, 500,000 kids in Iraq, and then said it was worth it. Madeleine Albright. Tell me something Putin's done that's within the same zip code of that. Not even close. And so, uh, and so, statistically speaking, the United States are the bad guys. And I'm a Reagan Republican, voted for Bush Sr. twice, voted for Bush Jr. once, couldn't forgive him for c committing war crimes in Iraq. So I didn't vote for him the second time. Um, I I'm not some pinko commie dog supporting Putin for this reason. What I do, what I want to be is I want to be the good guys. And we're not the good guys right now. We, we're, we're this. So when the Berlin Wall fell, I had two thoughts almost immediately. One was, wow, I spent my whole life thinking that the Soviet Union would never collapse. Even though I got hints from a friend who's got strong ties to Eastern Europe who said it, it is collapsing. But the second thought was, who's going to contain us? We had two equal and opposite forces pushing. And all of a sudden, one got pulled away. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, we're running around bombing countries in the Middle East, where before, with Russia lurking out there, with the Soviet Union lurking, we couldn't have done that. Mm. So we are unchecked. And we, the people, are not bad people. I think our leaders, are, there's some very bad people there. Victoria Newland, let's name one. Victoria Newland. But I think the Pentagon's full of them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it seems like it's war on us. It's war on uh, us. It, the American people, it does. Um, I kind of, Last question about Russia, though. What I mean, what did you think about the Nord Stream situation? Well, the audacity of us claiming Russia blew up its own pipeline <laughs> shows you what a bunch of psychopaths are involved. And that's where, that's where actually Sachs sort of shows up in the plot line. Where he all of a sudden says, of course it was the Russians, right? And 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 if I were a German, I'd be so goddamn mad because if they freeze their ass off this winter because we blew up the pipeline, whose fault is that, right? That is clearly 100. And it, it might not have been the United States in terms of who did it. It, right. it, it might have been a proxy team. You know, there's always rumors the Mossad does famous for us or MI6 does rumors for us or whatever. I think all the intelligence agencies have plenty of complete psychopaths that will do anything they're told because they're somehow profound believers that they are on the right side of history. Even though if they actually look at what they're doing, you go, I, you know, this... There's this great comedy skit by a British pair and they're, they're Nazis and it's during World War II. And one of them says to the other one, he says, and they're, they're fighting Russians. And he says, how do we know we're, the, we're not the baddies? And the other one says, oh, shut the fuck up, right? He says, no, uh, look, look at our helmets. And, and the, they had skull and crossbones on their helmets. He says, we have skull and crossbones on our helmets.
He says, they have a hammer and sickle, right? I, he says, how do we know we're not the baddies? It, it's a really funny skit, but it's a very poignant skit. Hmm. And, uh, and so I, 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 I am now convinced, which is not being helped by the book I'm reading right now. I'm, there's just some really, truly psychopathic people who are, who are essentially unchecked. So I think the CIA, for example, is basically a sleeper cell model. So I think there's so much going on inside the CIA that the head of the CIA doesn't have a clue. I had dinner one night with the head and of the who, CIA. Who's calling the shots then? Who, who well, would order just, the Nord Stream operation, even if it's farmed out? Like, who would green light that? I, I don't know. I don't know. So let's say some guy's up the ranks, and he makes the call. And, 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 and if, not, if it's a sleeper cell-like structure where you really don't know the connectivity within your own organization, um, then who do you call out? And do you call them out? Because they've been doing shit like this for the longest time. If you go back to the church commission back in the 70s, and they looked at all the shit that the CIA and the FBI did, it, it's wretched, wretched stuff. You know, framing people, sending them to prison for life and stuff like that to achieve some goal that 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 seems unnecessary. Um, infiltrating groups and killing people within the groups. I think I think you have to be willfully obtuse <laughs> to not um, believe that the FBI was crawling all over January 6th. And as to exactly how many and exactly their role, I don't know. Have you seen the Patriot Front? You know, mm. the Patriot Front? Patriot Front's this group of white supremacists. Now, if you gave me a buck for every white supremacist that I could identify, I would not make a lot of money. I wouldn't know where to look for them. They are by no stretch of the imagination our biggest risk, despite Biden administration's claim. These are at most a bunch of bubbas in the, in the, in the hills. Mm who are maybe some ex-vets who are disgruntled and their brains are a little jarred up and stuff like that. So along comes the Patriot Front. And at one level, it's kind of comical. They're all dressed up in khakis and blue shirts. They all wear white masks. They all have the same shields. They all have the same shoes. They march and step in a way that's so obvious that you go, these guys are military. Someone put it on Rogan's show one day and he goes, holy shit, that's the 101st Airborne. They are all about the same age. None of them have a beer gut. These are not MAGA guys. And they keep showing up. So one day they get arrested. And they all get hauled out of the back of a U-Haul. And why they pack 30 guys in the back of a U-Haul is a good question, right? There's a lot easier ways to travel. They were spooning in the back of a U-Haul. An anonymous tip. You go, oh, right, an anonymous tip. They arrest them. And then you watch the arrest photos. And they handcuffed them with their backpacks still on. One guy had a bullhorn wrapped over his shoulder, and he was handcuffed around it. They still had their masks on. They didn't take – and so some, some federal, federal investigator said, we'd take the belts, we'd take the masks, we'd take the backpacks, we'd take the bullhorn, nothing. They would keep nothing. That would be the first thing to come off those guys. He said, this is a farce. Now, here's the problem. I saw mug shots. I've got a Canadian military friend who says if you do a, a reverse Google on him, you can't find him. I don't know how to do the reverse Google, so I don't know how to confirm it. This guy's in the intel region of the Canadian military. And he says they don't exist by a reverse Google search. Now, I know some of them are real people. I do know that because they're in some of the pictures, unless it's Photoshopped. Um, but it shows the mug shots. Now, white supremacists, 30 guys. How many facial tattoos would you see, expect? Uh, what would be the facial tattoo density of white supremacists? Greater than one per. On Greater than one per person, right? These yeah. guys would be, yeah, there wasn't a single facial tattoo on a single one of them. So then you say, okay, this is the feds, this is farcical, isn't this funny? But then the question becomes much more fundamental, and that is, why are the feds doing that? Mm -hmm. Why? And did these guys sign up to join the FBI or the CIA to do shit like this? Do they have any sense of conscience right. when they're doing stuff to stir up trouble within the United States? And, and, and would it be that hard to make a case that what they're doing is treasonous? 
And so as a consequence, this is not a funny little story. It's not just farcical. You know, Ray Epps, is it Ray Epps or Larry Epps? I can never remember. I mixed it up. <laughs> the guy at January 6th, who was clearly a Fed. And when Merrick Garland is asked about him, he refused to answer. When his understudy was asked about him, she refused to answer. He was running the January 6th, and, and there's video footage of him going crazy, rallying the troops to charge the Capitol, right? This guy's a Fed. And then, you know, this guy, John Sullivan, who's uh, Antifa, and he's been all over the Antifa world. The Antifa guy said, figured him out months back. They said, he's not Antifa, don't trust him, right? It was all over Twitter saying, don't trust John Sullivan. And it turns out when you look up John Sullivan, what you discover is his father is military. His brother is a right winger running an organization. And John is an ex-nationally ranked cyclist. Is this what you'd expect an Antifa guy to look like? No. Antifa guys are guys who've dropped off the planet. They're the guys who have nothing left. That's the Eric Hoffers, the true believer. They are the people with nothing left, and therefore they join a cause. And so then next thing I know is there's video, and I catch it. Ray Epps talking to John Sullivan. Right? And I go, there it is right there. Now, John Sullivan also happened to be the one who filmed Ashley Babbitt getting killed. What a small little world we live in. How did all those different things all come together into one neat little picture? I don't know. I can go at Uvalde. I don't have an answer, but I have questions. What do you make of all this? I mean, what what can we make of this? I know we, we're not going to get to answers, but... That's right. We're not going to get the answers. We can get some questions, though. Well, I, someone's trying to fuck us up. I have two thoughts that one, I remember, uh, you know, there was, there was a particular um, political scientific advocate who was always on CNN. She was always on CNN a lot during COVID pandemic. She was also one of the only people interviewed around the Boston marathon bombing. Yeah. Lena Wen. Yeah. Lena Wang. A very just interesting thread. She's woven kind of like the always person on the spot. Yeah. Harvard for... medical school, Lena Wen, get the vaccine. She's, she became the spokesperson when Fauci lost credibility, when Gates lost credibility. Yeah. She was also, as you said, interviewed at the Boston Marathon. I go, oh, isn't that convenient? Yeah. Right? So I dug into Lena Wen. Lena Wen turns out, to, if you look at her resume, she's got a bunch of papers. But I know how to read scientific papers. If it's real technical, I'm not going to know it. Her papers were crap. There were things like papers in elite journals on the layout of an emergency room of some major hospital. They were just stupid papers. And it, it turns out that the biomedical community is paid for lock, stock and barrel by pharma. And so if you need to place a person Harvard Med and build them a resume, you own the journals. They will publish the paper. There was a paper that came out today calling for a more aggressive approach to vaccination. One of the co-authors was in Lancet. Chelsea Clinton. Like, oh, fuck me. Right? Kavanaugh cut his teeth as a prosecutor on the Vince Foster killing. There's pictures of John Kerry and Bob Mueller sitting next to each other in prep school. I, it, it, Every time you turn around, there's something that just makes you oh, go, what? Epstein's dad and the hired. Form the former. So, not, yeah. so, so Bill Barr's dad hired Jeffrey Epstein right. to teach at an elite prep school without a college degree. Right. Physics. It turns out Bill Barr's dad was intelligence. Right. And was writing like pornography. The like, whole. The. And, and we, someone, Rogan just said this. He said, we convicted Ghislaine, Ghislaine Maxwell of trafficking children to nobody. Right. And her dad. And, and, and her he dad. was a famous, famous Israeli spy, right? Her, yeah. Her dad, so, so, so Epstein. And, and her, huge media, uh, you know, uh, like tycoon. Right. Like, like a Rupert right. Murdoch. Fell off, of, 
fell off his boat mysteriously yeah. and drowned. That was named right. after Ghislaine. Right. I call her Jizz. Yeah. Um, me too. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, I think she so, was running so, Epstein. Do you remember the judge, the judge whose son and father res- opened the door? Yes, I heard. Yes. Responding, responding to uh, a FedEx package. Yes. And the FedEx guy shot the two of them. I remember that. And then, of course, the story went away quickly. Mm-hmm. You find out that the FedEx guy committed suicide, which kind of defeats the purpose of dressing up like a FedEx guy. But then what you find out is that he had previously worked for Kroll Associates, which is an intelligence group. Right. And she was, she had taken on a case that involved, just recently involved Deutsche Bank and Jeffrey Epstein. Right. And you got the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers where leaders all over the world, including Zelensky, have accounts in the Caymans all over the place and nothing ever happens. So who are these guys that go like this FedEx guy and do they not know they're going to get suicided? I think, for example, I think like um, I'm going to guess that the guys who spent a lot of time in prison um, after J6, I think I think a number of them were probably uh, FBI informants, we'll call it FBI affiliated. Sure. And what they didn't know is that they were being written out of the plot. So they they thought, oh, I'm with the FBI. I'm good to go. And they go, no, you're 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 like the guy in Star Trek who we don't recognize. You're going to get knocked off. Right. You're not a major player. You're expendable. And so like, I'm guessing um, QAnon Shaman probably uh, probably was was had affiliations with some agency. Wait, what? The, the what? Q, QAnon Shaman, the guy with the, the horns, the Viking hat guy. Mm-hmm. He was showing up all over Antifa rallies and shit. He he was all over the place. He he was everywhere. By the way, I had seen videos of Ashley Babbitt before she got shot. How how can I see videos of Ashley before she got shot and then realize it's the same person who got shot? We're back to the tiny little world story. Right. In terms of you know tiny little world maybe zoom out you know the 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 name of your paper the main themes with the crisis of of authority and the age of narratives and you touch a bit about on, on propaganda and i heard you recently talking on pomp show about uh you reading a book about edward bernays mm-hmm. and he's a really interesting character i had only recently learned about him re- uh, learned about him recently so he's uh i think the nephew or the son of freud I'm trying to remember that part. And Edward Bernays, to, to 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 provide some background, was the guy who basically invented propaganda, the concept, the concept of pro- formal propaganda. Right? right, it was public relations, and he used it to sell cigarettes to women, and used it to sell pianos to rich people, and things like that. And in his book, his 1926 book, he was always ranting about how politicians hadn't yet figured out how to use it. Well, apparently they did. And then by the 50s, he was doing political shit. And I think I think he was soon on on pay. I think he's soon on on salary um, for bad guys. So his his uncle is Sigmund Freud. Okay. so I I find that connection really interesting. And I don't know if you know this, but his great nephew is uh, Mark Randolph, who was the CEO, the first CEO and co-founder of Netflix. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. So I, I would have thought you knew this. So no. I, this is fucking astonishing. You go from Freud to Bernays to Bernays head of Netflix. And you think about right. like where what Netflix, their position in society today and the way they can kind of push material on on people. people. And, and, mm-hmm. and I think in the last four years, they've changed dramatically when Obama left office. Uh, I, I think sort of the underwriting of all their content changed. What's and, your take on Elon Musk? What's going on there? Uh, well, I was going to ask you because you're the scientist. Um, I think he's a marketer. I, I think he's a huckster. Um, yeah, a grifter. Yeah. Uh, I, brilliant. I, yeah. Brilliant. I, would use, 
I don't, I, don't, I was reluctant to use that word because uh, I, I, I don't, you know, I mean, that's just hard to pinpoint, but I don't think that's inaccurate. Uh, I, I think he's very good at, at marketing and selling and then working the system to, you know, whatever he does, he buys intellectual capital. He then markets that to make it bigger than it seems uh, is it, sort of my take. I'm very confounded, though, with what he's been doing recently. I think he speaks a lot of times out of turn, meaning like he says some dumb shit, in my opinion. Um, but he's also Unfiltered. done some risky stuff. He's done some right. risky stuff. And, and I like his sort of uh, flippancy. So it's a mixed bag for me. Uh, I get mm -hmm. very upset with his Dogecoin and, and, and his, the Bitcoin thing and... His, well, his, he was funding he was funding Tesla on those scams. Sure, yes, he was. And I think he did that well. But I think he was also messing with people and, and their minds and, and and giving them, I wouldn't say misinformation, but not, you know, you know, he, he's got a very wide audience. I don't know if they all can filter. Well, he was doing a pump properly. and dump scheme where yes. there, where it's a wild west. And as a consequence, yeah. there's no rules. Right. But now if you're going to then come. So great. You do that. And then you come and tell me you're going to save humanity and freedom of speech. I, I'm not buying it. Right. And, and and so like now I just don't trust the man. I think he's full of shit. If, if we really look at him um, from that perspective. And I don't know if he's a, 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 a an agent of, of the state, any state. I don't know what his agenda is. It's well, a very, so let me put it this way. Guy. His tech existence, it goes from PayPal to, sure. He was a small uh, part of PayPal. You know, I mean, right. they bought his technology, whatever that was. But but by putting him in Silicon Valley, it connects him up with the, oh, yeah. uh, the, the, the military world. And those are the most formidable guys in Silicon Valley, the PayPal mafia. That's right. Then he goes to making rockets and battery technology and stuff like that. And he gets away with murder in terms of making claims that are preposterous and mm -hmm. no one can touch him. And I think he's flaunting the fact that he can't be touched or he's think, protected. Well, that's what I mean. He can't yeah. be touched because he's protected. Right. So 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 um, actually, the book I'm reading about the CIA right now is a guy who went to write. An anniversary article years ago on Charles Manson. Mm. And when he started interviewing people in Hollywood about Manson, he kept hitting these terrible stone walls. And the more stone walls you get, the deeper he dug. And it's pretty clear that Manson was somehow tied with a bunch of uh, FBI type shit that was involved in dealing with subversives in the 60s. And that that Manson is almost a chapter in that in that story. Now, I'm not done with the book, so I don't know if he's going to pull it together brilliantly or not, but it's a, it, it is a fascinating whodunit. Right. And it's pretty clear that the uh, LAPD and, and various players went way out of their way to not catch Manson. And then I think they finally had to wrap him up. But they delayed it by about four months. And my guess is because they had to clean up some messes and stuff. Um, but but it was during a period where they were infiltrating the Black Panthers and slaughtering people and, and creating strife within subversive organizations. And you know, at some level, if you don't pay too close attention, you go, well, you know, they're protecting us, but not when you're actually killing people. Right. That that's, that's, and that's where January 6th comes in. And that's not acceptable to me. Um, and, um, uh, and, um, I wrote a ton on the Vegas shootings. The Las Vegas shootings turn out to be from head to toe wrong from absolutely head to toe. There's nothing about the Vegas shootings that hold together, which is why you will never hear the gun, anti-gun advocates saying, remember Vegas. It's the biggest it's shooting since the Civil War. It's disappeared. It got totally memory. I didn't know that fact either. That, I mean, that just, yeah, well, I didn't know that. I mean, tell yeah, me, tell so me more it, because that's just astonishing. Well, there's a documentary out this year. So for me, it was like an answer key because I wrote about 20 pages back. I think that was about 2017 too. That was a big year for me, I guess. Um, and and the story fell apart and, and it it even fell apart in the mainstream press. So Tucker Carlson and Coulter were all over it saying this is this is wrong. There's something here. Every last shred of the Vegas story is perforated. If you find the documentary, I think it's called Route 91. It's over on Rumble or something like that. And there's cop videos and stuff. And there were there were shooters all over the place. 
Now, the thing that caught my eye, there's a bunch of things. I give you a completely trivial one. There's so many things wrong with the story, but a trivial one is one day CBS News wrote about it. And they said, um, they said, Stephen Paddock's hard drive was missing. Now, I said something like, don't you hate it when you lose your hard drive, right? Which is just an absurdity. But then CBS News went on to say, but this is not that weird because they listed about five mass killers and all their hard drives were missing. I go, so I'm supposed to think therefore that's normal? So mass killers don't all take out their hard drives. So there's a, there's a footprint of mass killing that shows up over and over and over. And that is if you talk to people on the spot when it happened, there's almost always a discussion of multiple shooters. And it always reduces to one crazy bastard within a day or two. They are always drug addled teenagers in which no one ever actually explains why they did it. You see them in court. You don't see the trial. You don't see testimony. You don't see anything. They get put away. It's over. You can't even name any of them. Right. And so uh, I, in a in an investment meeting about two weeks ago, I gave a t- I we, I was asked to sit on a panel and talk about conspiracies, and they said, "Give me one conspiracy, don't defend it, just throw it out, and let's let the audience ask questions." And there was four of us, I think, three or four of us. And I I start out, I said, uh, "There's little green men in my iPhone," <laughs> and then I said, "No, just kidding." Hmm. I said, uh, "Okay, let's try that again." I said liberals have taken over academia and i go no no that's so good either um and then i said um i said i think many if not most of the of the mass killers are sovereign actors and i believe that at this point are what actors sovereign what's that mean they are working working for a state they are cia Mossad. i don't know who. yeah they are working for and i don't know what their purpose is You could say it's to get rid of guns, but I I actually think it's more likely, it's just a hunch, that it's to keep us fighting about guns. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uvalde is a great story. I I have very few real, ironically, what I'd call a smoking gun, but there are parts of the Uvalde story that simply don't make any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I'll point them out, but first and foremost, you know, some guy goes into a school. There's a bunch of screwy things that happen before he goes in that should have been caught, should have been dealt with, and they weren't. And so you say already there's incompetence showing like he shot someone outside the school and then 15 minutes later got in the school. They should have responded faster than that, that sort of thing. But none of those are real smoking guns. He gets in the school and for 77 minutes, he's killing kids and no one goes in. So right away you go, look, you give me 10 guys out of the phone book, two of them would have gone in. They would have gone in barehanded, but they didn't. Uvalde is a town of 15,000. 50 miles away is a town of 20,000. 80 miles away is San Antonio. There were 372 cops at Uvalde. Where did they come from? Now, the guy who goes in and kills him, an off-duty security guard, uh, border security, goes in and kills him. Do you know his name? Have you ever seen him interviewed? Wouldn't he be a hero? Do you remember the mom who ran in and grabbed her kids and ran out? They made her a villain. Not only that, but she only did one interview. And it was inconsistent. If you listen to the interview, she contradicts herself all the way through the interview. What does that mean? Well, she starts out by saying, I did this. And then off the, her next couple of sentences, she said, then I did this. And it's not consistent with what she said two sentences back. So she said she ran in and she was asking people for vests. They wouldn't give them to her. And then she gets asked, were there any cops? And she says, not a cop in sight. So you got None of this makes sense. It reminded me of Stephen Paddock's brother. He got interviewed after Stephen Paddock supposedly killed, shot 500 people in Las Vegas, in which the chief of police said it was not physically possible for one man to shoot 1,100 rounds, period. And the audio shows that there's shooters all over the goddamn place. Everything's wrong. But but Stephen Paddock's brother got interviewed, and he was incoherent, which you can imagine him not being a happy guy. But when I listened to him, I heard a guy who sounded like he was attempting to say nothing. It was an incoherence 
that looked like he was trying to just say nothing. The key witness was a guard on the floor, got shot in the leg. Remember that guy? Some guy named Jesus or something. Had two social security numbers. Um, his house was being guarded by guys with unlabeled license plates. He then disappears. They said he went to Mexico. And when they were asked, why do you go to Mexico? Well, he planned a vacation. Would you really let that guy go to Mexico? I don't think so. And then he came back. He did one interview with Ellen DeGeneres, who overtly said about five fucking times, this is the only interview you're going to do. And I know this is hard for you. And the guy who was with him at the interview looked like a handler. And he did most of the talking. Now, what's really weird about the handler is I had seen an, a video of him that night at the shootings. What's this, What's going on here, right? And what I picked up on when I what I usually someone someone said it said you have an ability to go from thirty five thousand feet down to ground level real fast to look at something, and I thought that was pretty interesting. And what got me to ground level on this was. Uh, there's an interview of a guy named Mike Cronk. He was on site. It, was, it had just happened. He tells the story about how his friend got shot three times in the chest. Now, later on, a marksman said, no way, because the spray would be too much. You wouldn't get hit three times too far away. But Mike tells about how his friend stuck his fingers in his own bullet holes to stop the bleeding. I don't think so, Mike. Why are you lying? Right, right away. Why are you lying, Mike? And then he talks about putting him on a cart, wheeling him to the hospital and blah, blah, blah. And he's OK now, I think, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the 15 second rollover of YouTube occurs. And there's Mike Cronk again, new network, new interviewer, same story. But it's changed. He's a little more emotional. And he put him on the back of a truck. And why are you lying, Mike? Gets to the end, 15-minute rollover. Now there's 20,000 people at this goddamn concert. Next interview, new network, Mike Kronk. There he is telling the story again. So then where it really iced, where Mike Kronk really came to a head, was I. they were showing interviews of people in the hospital who had been shot. And I remember looking at this one girl. She didn't look that worse off. She hadn't been shot in the leg, but I had been reading trauma surgeons saying, you get shot with one of those suckers. We're talking 10 surgeries to repair your sorry ass. It, they said, if you get hit in the leg, it doesn't have to hit an artery. It'll turn your leg to jello. You'll bleed out on the battlefield. And there she is just chatting away. This interview, this shooting victim. I'm going, that seems a little creepy. And the surgeons were all saying there's something wrong with the story. Then Mike Kronk and a TV crew goes to the hospital to visit his friend. I go, oh, this is gonna get interesting. So what would his friend look like? Well, three shots to the chest with AR-15. He's gonna be in intensive care. He's gonna be a mess. The only way you're gonna know that he's alive is there's gonna be a beeping sound. There's gonna be busyness everywhere and there's no fucking chance of film crews getting in there. Mike goes in there and there's his friend and they're chatting. I go, my first thought is, what, you stick your fingers in the holes again so you can talk now? His friend has a nasal cannula. That's it. A little oxygen. A little oxygen. And then I notice, my wife's had 60 surgeries. I do know what a hospital looks like. Um, the screen behind him is black. It's turned off. Wasn't a real hospital. Now, some of the stuff I found, the documentary didn't, but the documentary has a tremendous amount of footage of cop camera footage and cops saying there's a shooter around the corner at the corner of such and such. There's helicopters that were behind the Mandalay and they're following their transponders getting turned on and off throughout the whole thing. And it's clear there's a tremendous number of people who think there was some woman, this is amazing actually, there was some woman walking through the crowd 45 minutes before the shooting saying you're all going to die in 45 minutes. What was that about? No one knew. And so they finally called the cops on and they escorted her out of the concert because she was creeping everyone out. And then they all got shot. That's the most bizarre 
aspect. That's right. Like, well, how did that even so fit what, the plot? Like, she might have, someone might have tipped her off and she might have been losing her shit and going, walking around going, get the fuck out of here. You know, who knows? Who knows? What is also interesting, like you mentioned the black screen, like, why all the on force mistakes? Well, yeah. that see, one of my concerns is that with the power of modern media now, it almost seems like they don't try to get away with it. They just depend on the media to make sure the story gets told right. So, for example, I don't think Watergate ever would have happened. That story never would have been told. And Watergate... Those are a bunch of psyop guys, right? That wasn't just a bunch of clowns going in trying to get that. That was G. Gordon Liddy, for Christ's sakes. These guys were famous, famous psyop guys. But I think the problem is, is now they just say, look, we can do it dirty. And we'll just make sure the media doesn't tell us the story correctly. Look at the look at the COVID story. Look at the lying. Yeah. That's going on in the COVID story. And they just they just cleared the vaccine for kids to be put on their regimen for preschool and school yeah. requirements. Right. There's not a person left in the planet who thinks that's a good idea. And they all voted 15 to nothing to do right. that. What kind of twisted fucks? Right. If I'm a parent, my kid gets vaccinated, and they die. I'm going to go find one of those bastards. I am going to go find one of those bastards and make sure that they pay. Yeah. It, it was interesting when talking about, I think uh, it's Mike Conk, his name? Cronk. Cronk. Search Mike Cronk on your computer. You know what you'll find? Here's a guy who's a who's a, a hick from Alaska. And there's all these uh, fact checks, denunciations of the guys who think Mike Cronk's a crisis actor. Since when does a hick from Alaska get protected by fact checkers? Right. Well, yeah. And the, the fact checking, I mean, everything on there is like kind of like bills in it's Congress. It's the opposite. Uh, well, it's, it's, he, it's, it's a propaganda machine. It's yeah. Edward Bernays times 10, right? It now, is. it turns out that Lombardo, who said that, that it wasn't possible for one guy to shoot all these rounds, a day later said it was one guy. Lombardo's now running for Congress. Mike Cronk's running for state Senate. And he reminds me of Lena Wang in this story. You got it. Yep. And whatever yeah. happened to those two guys? Which two guys? The Boston Bombers. Tell me. Well, I don't know. Oh, no, they, those... they disappeared. Yeah, that's uh, right. That disappeared. And the and Oklahoma was... bombing, there were extras there that never yeah. got found. Yeah. Right? And what, what, well, I mean, talk about these bombings, like even like um, the school shootings in 9 11, I thought an interesting thread there was uh, uh, Paul Manafort. I don't know if you remember Paul Manafort mm -hmm, from, mm -hmm. but you know, his family owns the Manafort brothers construction company and right. they've done the excavations on every, basically every school shooting and, and the world trade center. That's right. And, I just heard the other day about the world trade center. They were yeah. in charge of clearing the iron out of the Correct. world trade center. You know, I'm probably like a billion in gold. probably <laughs> disappeared. And no, I think they backed the trucks up and found the gold. They found the gold. I think uh, that, but, I think they went and grabbed the gold. Yeah, well, I mean, found the gold, and whether they have the gold, when they found all the gold, and yeah, I know, you know, I know. Um, it, building it, seven, whole nine yards. Yeah, the whole nine yards. It's it's you know, it really is the age of narratives, and, and this massive propaganda just being spewed at us. So here's the problem: is that I run into extremely educated, rational individuals who talk like this now. So we, we're, we're not a couple of guys, and I don't want to offend anyone here, but we're not a couple of guys, you know, tweeting from our parents' basement, bitching about weird shit. I run into extremely prominent characters. Well, I was very careful. I only had this conversation with a professor of chemistry at Cornell because of that reason, like to give it well, that Well, the other guy I could talk to is a guy named Mark Crispin Miller at NYU. He's a propaganda expert. He actually is involved in the latest release of Bernays' book. And Mark Crispin Miller, every semester, teaches a course on propaganda in which he uses contemporary news events to show the propaganda. 
And he is all over this Ukraine story. He is all over the, the COVID story. He can just smell the propaganda. The guy's got the nose. He can see the tricks. He can see the tools being used. So Mark Crispin Miller, he'll answer his emails. At least he answers my emails. So you should reach out to him and get him on the show. Yeah, I think that sounds awesome. Uh, I guess my final question to you then is, you know, do you have any words of advice for people to kind of, you know, you know, I, I mean, do we focus on this stuff? Do we ignore it? Uh, you know, how do we just kind of uh, deal with this situation today uh, going forward? Well, my answer is somewhat age dependent. So I do have students show up in my office who want to talk. Mm. And and my answer to them is some variant of if you go down the rabbit holes now, you will never achieve anything important in your life. I'm 67. Mm. So I can go down rabbit holes for a hobby and it just doesn't matter. Right. So, so I said, you really ought to leave the bitching and hiking up your pants and bitching about the government to the old guys because you got to learn how to make robots and, you know, cure diseases and stuff like that. And, and by the way, even my world was shattered by the COVID story because I'm, I was pretty connected with pharma. So I've collaborated with probably 80% of the big cap pharmas collaborated or consulted with, you know, consulted with Pfizer for 20 years was on Merck's five scientists, long range steering committee, right? Two med guys, three chemists. And, uh, and I never saw the corruption, which I can now see inside pharma. The reason is, is the corruption is very localized at the clinical trial stage. Mm. So the whole drug world is being, in my mm -hmm. opinion, rigged at the clinical trial stage. Right. And there's all sorts of things that didn't used to happen that now happen. And so uh, so the um, so the vaccine just follows. It's just a big, bold version of shit they've been doing for quite a while. And and the FDA is completely and utterly corrupt. There's just it's just there. There might be good guys in there. But I, it's it's one of those, you know, some of those cells might be OK, but take out the whole tumor. Right. I would scrub it from head to toe. The 17 virologists who committed fraud by writing a letter saying that, that the virus came from nature when they knew it didn't. I did a Twitter poll on that and said, let's assume that we can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that they knew they were lying. This is the beginning of a potentially horrific pandemic. And they put out bad info. So the question then becomes, what would you do to them? And the choices I gave were nothing, 3.5%. I think those are guys who hit the wrong key by mistake. Um, a choice included uh, lose their funding and their jobs, uh, go to prison for some number of years. And then I said, go to prison for life without parole. That one got 50%. And some people said, no, nah, death penalty. And I go, no, I want them to watch. I want them to sit there and ponder what they did. And, um, and, and, and they're, they're going to get away with it. I, I think they're mm -hmm. going to be outed. So I think the COVID story is unraveling pretty badly. There's 16,000 lawsuits. And there are, some of them are getting one now. And judges have dead grandchildren from the vaccine and things like that. The, the, this story is not going to stay hidden. Uh -uh. Whether we get the people at the level that I would like to, which always involves 10 minutes alone with a bat. Um, Tony Fauci, in my opinion, is a mass murderer. And I'm not being metaphorical. I think he is a mass murderer. I think he's killed many, many, many thousands potentially before COVID. His clinical trials were sad. Let me, let me give you just one example. It is estimated that he ran clinical trials using various drugs of varying degrees of toxicity on 14,000 inner city foster kids. Who's more defenseless than that? He used inner city foster kids to run his clinical trials. Dr. Mengele can't stack up to that. 
He rigged clinical trials on AZT. AZT was a killer drug. It was lethal drug. And, and if you look at the mode of action, it just chops the shit out of your DNA. It's just, there's nothing smart about it. It doesn't surgically go in and find the right thing to clip. It just massacres you. They rigged the trial completely to get the first AIDS drug. Now, here's the cool part. Once you have your first AIDS drug, and they did it by unblinding it, switching patients from the two groups if they had to, giving blood transfusions to people who were getting AZT to keep them alive, right? I mean, it was a complete, utter fraud. Now that you have AZT and you get a new drug, let's pick a new one like Splenda, aspartame. Your control group is AZT. So now the new drug, including sugar cubes, will beat AZT because they're slaughtering them. The, I think the thing that probably killed the most people in the COVID pandemic was uh, ICUs being mandated to use only remdesivir. Virologists were stunned that a, vi that a respiratory virus was killing people by taking out their livers and their kidneys. They go, what kind of virus is this? It was baffling. And then one doc finally figures it out. He, he looked up the toxicity profile of remdesivir, and that's the toxicity profile. And then he looks up the whole process that got remdesivir cleared. And it turns out it was a panel of a bunch of guys from Gilead who cleared remdesivir. Not only cleared it, but also they, they wrote a white paper saying, here's how you die of COVID, right? So, so to hand all the hospitals, okay, when a person gets COVID, they're going to get this and this and this and on the checklist were all the remdesivir toxicity profile. So when someone died of kidney failure, they go, oh yeah, there's COVID right there. So I wouldn't be shocked if remdesivir killed 80% of the ICU victims. I'm just guessing, I'm throwing out just a complete, yeah. complete wild hairy ass guess, but its nickname is run death is near. And so then the question is, what do you do with the person who knowingly signed off on that? Now, there's no question you execute that person. Right? There's no question. I'll pull the lever. I'll volunteer. I'll do it without a hood on. And so all these things are out there. Um, you got insurance companies admitting that lots of people are dying for unknown reasons, but they won't say why. I've gotten two explanations. One is that they're not letting us know. And the other is that the insurance companies have stopped paying attention to cause. They just tabulate data now that it's gone mindless. And that's believable, actually. There are almost no autopsies on vaccine injured people. There's very, very few. And the ones the Germans did about 40 and the guys who died from them clearly got, got jabbed and then died. They're finding the most bizarre combination of brain damage and heart failure. And that's the spike protein. So my big concern and it's not, I'm not alone. Is it every one of us who've been jabbed? You've been jabbed? Uh, no. Okay. Well, I had to either get jabbed or quit my job. And so I did. So crazy theory. Am I really going to give up a, a really well-paying job because of a crazy theory? No. So I said, okay, take it for the team. Um, it, 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 I, I think there's, it's possible that everybody has some level of damage, much of it is subclinical. So I did a Twitter poll. Again, I love Twitter polls. So I got 85,000 followers. So they actually are pretty good sample sizes sometimes. And I said, I'm looking for an under the radar stat. Do you have an ailment that doesn't seem major, but is a little unusual that emerged over the last year? It was clear what I was asking for, the way I phrased it. I said it could be an unusual aches, pain, psoriasis, something that you've shaken off 50% yes out of 2,000. My son got shingles at 32. My wife lost control of something she was controlling with medication that I think is seizure-like activity. It's a complicated thing. It's called cyclic vomiting syndrome. I had on my arm 
the appearance of this bright red rash. It looks like I must have gotten into the poison ivy. Showed up that fast, was all over the arm. I've had psoriasis like things where I get a little itch on my leg and over the next 10 years, it gets a little bigger. And this thing would not respond to either steroids or antifungal. It just happened about a month ago. And it's not going away. I'll be okay as long as it doesn't spread. But, you know, that gets into the maybe. I feel creaky, but I'm an old man. So I'm a lousy data point. But the number of people dropping out of sporting events and stuff saying, I, I just don't have it. I just, I just can't get the oxygen. I used to get in the Tour de France, for example, big dropout rate. And then you get all the dead athletes, the five-fold increase in dead soccer players, which is the military keeps good data. And the military is seeing between 300 and 1,700% increases in certain ailments. And so all this is being covered over. I, I can't say hidden because we know about it. It's being suppressed. Because of the press. I'm in a doctor's No, Zoom suppressed. Group I mean, it's being suppressed. Oh, suppressed. Yeah. Yeah. By the press. And, um, and the problem is you can also say, well, maybe it's COVID. You know, maybe it is. But people have also done studies where they say, let's look at the people who got a jab, got an effect, got a jab, got a worse effect, got a third jab, got a worse effect. That correlates, right? And, and those problems are showing up. I talk to the, I ask medical people when, when I'm in a doctor's office or hospital, I usually get kind of nothing, but I think they've been conditioned to don't, don't give it up. You'll lose your job. But the other day I was in a, with a physician's assistant. I said, you seen any, anything in coming through your office over the last year that's appearing in unusual frequency. And I saw her pause for a second. And then she said, she knew what I was asking. She said, yeah. Um, unusual levels of diagnosable cancer, uh, heart problems, and shingles. And I said, do other people in the office see it? And she says, I, I just don't understand. I can see it. She's probably seeing 2,000 patients a year easily. She said, it's like there's this delusion. They just don't want to admit that they're seeing it. And is that human nature, I guess? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I do think it's human nature. I, I mean, I typed and died suddenly into Google today. Oh my God. And, it's and, a big number. You have to go at least one page in. Uh, oh yeah. So it's all covered up. Yeah. 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 Um, but there's just, and you click on each article and, um, they're all local news stories there. They seem to be legit. That's and right. Just, and I, and then I, one of them, you go into like page five or six and Snopes is, well, you know, this is not unusual it. and it, it just reads like, like fiction. Well, now pharma um, ads are advertising myocarditis treatment. Yeah. But my concern is that we all have some level of damage and some of it's subclinical and some of it got hyperclinical and they died. So what, okay. And like, things in between. Uh, what do you, I mean, I mean, is this, uh, uh good intentions gone bad or is i mean what I makes what, so. I, what i think here is batch numbers i want to know your, there were different batch numbers to all these admissions um let me explain what might what might explain that first of all the specs on a drug are usually pretty tight the specs on this vaccine it's something like 120 base pairs the specs are anywhere from 55 to 120 what do you mean by that like well so if you have 120 base pairs in this long biomolecule as low as 55 is considered acceptable. So you're getting so a that, half that, of a spike a, protein. That you're sounds like a, a large protein. deviation. It's a yeah. humongous deviation, a deviation yeah. of one, right? 119 being tolerable <laughs> is a little questionable, <laughs> right? So here's where the problem gets real sketchy. And this is something that is, I, I was on a Zoom call. My doctor's Zoom group has had every famous anti-vaxxer on the planet through the Zoom group. This Sunday, we're bringing in Archbishop Vigano from the Vatican, who came out and was attacking the New World Order for trying to depopulate the goddamn world. So, it, I mean, we are Bobby Kennedy, Malone, McCullough, you name it, every single one. one so one night we we're on and Ryan Cole comes and goes and he's very good. And he said something as soon as he said it, I go, oh, my God, of course. In the olden days, if you were in a biochem lab, if you want to chop up DNA, 
Just put it in a blender. Because it turns out that these long stringy molecules can be sheared really easily. You take a standard organic molecule, you can stir it all day. It won't break the molecule. To break the molecule, you have to break strong bonds mechanically. But the thing is, if the molecule is super long and held together by just single bonds, now it's like trying to break something that's really skinny and, and long. And so it's real easy to break it. So it shears. And so when you handled nucleic acids, and polynucleotides, even when I was an undergrad, you, if you took a pipette and took it out, you, you treated it carefully because you'll, you'll shear it, you'll break it. And then one day, Ryan Cole, we're having this chat about this. And he said, well, here's the problem. You've got a big vat. You can't just put a big propeller in it and stir it like crazy. At the same time, you're using a lipid nanoparticle to dissolve it. Now, lipid nanoparticles in an aqueous solution is exactly like oil and vinegar salad dressing. So how do you pour an oil and vinegar salad dressing without shaking it? You can't. You'll end up with oil because that's what's on the top. So you can't stir it vigorously or you'll destroy the molecule. And at the same time, your vaccine might have come from the top of the vat where all the greasy shit is, or from the bottom of the vat where it's basically water. Hmm. And then I, it just hit me. I said, holy fuck. The difference between the top and the bottom of a vat. And I used to consult for pharma process. These are big, huge vats. And they put airplane propellers in there, basically, and whiz those things and whip it around. And yeah, you know, have you ever seen like a, a restaurant size cake mixer? Right. And they put these whisks and it whips around and it whips up the dough. That's how you would have to do it. But that would destroy the molecule. No question. So they can't mix it. So you're going to get this heterogeneity. You're going to get this wide range of possibilities. And as Ryan put, he also said, you know, after they got sloppy, one minute you're, you know, doing from some minus 78 degree freezer and freezing it really carefully to giving it to people from football stadiums that's been sitting out in the hot sun. I, I couldn't get over that. Uh, I took my parents they, to a football stadium. Well, but here's and, the key is if it sat in the hot sun, it means they got a shitty vaccine. But also it was run so haphazardly. Right. Hey, are you here? Your first or your second? How many are you? Looks like, oh, oh, there's one of you. Oh, there's three of you. Oh, let me go. Right. And someone else, I'm going to go tell someone else what you need and I'm going to come back. And, uh, and then we're going to trap you in here for 15 minutes after we administrate it so that if you, I mean, it was just very. But then there's things like if you don't aspirate the syringe to check to make sure you haven't hit a vein or something. Right. You that, that's why I was like, how are you administrating this in a very non-medicinal environment? And I'm not a fan of uh, hospitals and how medicinal they can be in the blaring white lights. But like, but at least you're getting just... a trained nurse. Yeah. This was For all like you know, you're getting program. a fireman doing. Yeah, it, this right? was a I jobs mean... program. And... Right. And so then so then you have this problem where um it turns out the Japanese put radio labels in the thing and track the vaccine. Within 20 minutes, it spreads throughout your body. It didn't stay in the muscles. Right. Like they the said point they of maximum accumulation were the ovaries. You really want your 18-year-old daughter getting an mRNA parking in her ovaries you only get so many eggs do you really want to be sticking that spike protein shit in her in her ovaries and the answer is no and it also crosses the blood brain barrier so do you really want the spike protein getting in your brain and you wonder why all of a sudden you got covid fog and you're getting seizures you're getting bell's palsy my colleague got Bell's palsy. I said, it's the Vax, dude. And he said, oh, no, no, no. And his face drooping. He says, no, I, I got it years ago. And I said, you don't think it could have exacerbated it? You don't think it could have? I think, I think this spike protein, and this will sound anthropomorphic. I think this spike protein has this sort of uncanny ability to figure out where you're weak and go for it. 
So if you're prone to, for example, if you are already diabetic, it somehow gets there. And I, I, it sounds very unscientific to say this, but it seems as though if you have a seizure disorder, your seizures get worse. If you have a brain problem, your brain problem gets worse. It, it, just, it just seems to go for your weakness. And it could be it just does generalized damage. It's enough wherever you're weak, you just get a little weaker. But my f concern is that all of us who got vaccinated have some amount of brain damage. Now, we might be okay. It might be done. It might be that's it. Okay, I can't remember people's names quite as much as I. If this is it, I'm fine. But here's the problem I have. So in this chat with Ryan Cole, who's not just a smart bastard, but he's going to every COVID conference on the planet because he's one of the big five, one of the big 10 anti-vaxxers. So he is in constant, his email box, someone said, can I send you an email? He says, I've got 20,000 emails you can try. Um, hmm. And I asked, I said, okay, I keep trying to get to the, a question that I've gotten a lot of answers to and I want your opinion. I said, what are the odds that this vaccine is getting into your DNA? Now, the brilliance of RNA is, is that it makes the protein and then eventually degrades and then it no longer makes protein. If it gets to your DNA, if it reverse transcribes into your DNA, your cells now have it. And I had heard people saying, look, when, when two cells break apart, it's a daughter cell. It's called a daughter cell. And McCullough, I think, has said, we're finding the spike protein in the daughter cells. It is getting to the DNA. So I asked Ryan Cole, I said, what are the odds it's getting to your DNA? And he said, 100%. He says, it is. That means we've done an evolutionary experiment. We now have a gigantic chunk of the global population, if this is true, if it's pervasive, who now produce spike protein for the rest of their lives. Now, that's the darkest story. And I, I still, as much as he's as good a source as I know, 100% is a pretty accurate number. <laughs> and I, I, I think it's got to be less than 100, but, but it didn't say 75. There was no doubt in his mind. He, by the way, had a, an ailment. I can't remember what it was. It was not mononucleosis, but it was something, some viral thing that it was familiar to me. He said, he says, he said uh, before I got COVID, I had had some trouble with it after I got COVID. It's been chronic. He said, he said, I, I can go about four hours a day and then I have to, I have to unwind. I got nothing left. And so again, separating the vaccine from the disease, very hard to do. Although you could do it, statisticians would have no trouble, except for the authorities do not want the answer. Because they will all hang from the neck until dead if they get the answer. We had last Sunday, you know, this British chick named Christine Anderson, MEP from, uh, from, from the European Union. You remember seeing her and she got the Pfizer VP to admit that yes. they didn't test it? Yes. She was our guest on Sunday on the Zoom group. I'm talking, th th these are cool interviews, right? And we get to ask questions and been doing this off and on for about a year now. I'm the resident chemist. We've got an NSA guy. We've got doctors, lawyers. We've got the, the people tend to come and go, but one of the guys is the lead counsel for the inside whistleblower for Pfizer, where they're blowing the whistle on Pfizer in, in these whistleblowing suits. If you can prove it, then Pfizer has to pay back the government, which is an estimated trillion dollars, and has to pay the whistleblower triple damages, which is $3 trillion. Now, it's never going to happen but it still boggles the mind to think about that. He's the guy who said there are 16,000 lawsuits and they are starting to get won. And as the lawyers learn how to win lawsuits, I think it'll cascade because, you know, let's say you got fired by your employer for not vaccinating and you, you're one of 10 employees and you sue. That guy can't really defend himself. And you kind of, Find out if you can get the guy's back pay and make some money. And you find out what works and you get better at it. And then next thing you know, 
employees at Cornell with, you know, 20,000 employees are now suing. And then pretty soon you're up to Procter and Gamble and you're up to, you know, and, and there are 16,000 lawsuits right now. Well, the, I, the, the system's learning. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see it all unfold. Um, it could be you, frustrating. Yeah. I it mean, it's be, alarming what you shared and it's going to be incredibly frustrating. And But it could uh, be frustrating like, like we never really get them. We get the, the yeah. knowledge, which I already have, I think. But I would love, I would love for all the, the sanctimonious people who were brutal on those who didn't want to vaccinate to have to suck it up. I don't because know they we'll really well, I don't even know either because they're human beings and they can't face reality after you've committed yourself emotionally to that. Uh, by the way, I have a book to read for you. It's short, it's easy, it's kind of life altering for me. Call, it's by Eric Hoffer called The True Believer. I noticed it's your about, handle's The True Disbeliever right now. That's where I came from. That's where I came from. And it turns out that Hoffer in 1953 wrote this book about how mass movements start, what fuels them, what the various players are like, why it gets auctioned in some cases, not others. And how they end, depending on whether uh, what he calls uh, uh, men of action take over or whether it turns into a sort of a tragic finish. But it starts out, it's really, it'll be familiar to you. It starts out, these mass movements starts out usually in, in some intellectual level of society, like faculty. Let's talk critical race theory. Let's talk about the possibility there's a systemic racism. It's a reasonable thing to talk about. But then the fanatics get it. Next thing you know, you get the fanatics are interestingly, they are, according to Hoffer, invariably bottom of the food chain. I hate to be harsh. They're people whose lives aren't worth much to them. And they feel like any change would be an improvement. And they feel like that if they can somehow tie themselves to an important movement, it makes them more important. And it takes the responsibility for them having a shitty life off them. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's right. the Republicans' fault. It's the Democrats' fault. It's Klaus Schwab's fault. It's Bill Gates' fault. And the fanatics drive the damn thing. Global climate change is classic, classic stuff. And then what happens is if, 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 if it eventually sort of works itself into something more tangible and it can end okay or can end bad, depending on what it is. And uh, and if you don't get rid of the fanatics and replace them with people who can get something done, then it just goes batshit. Yeah. The biggest one is climate change. That is the biggest one. $150 trillion. That's a so big it's a great one. book. That's a big uh, one. I think on that note, right. I would be a, a, a remiss to say that, you know, we as Bitcoiners think that Bitcoin is that solution. Well, so it's here's the let point. me let me explain to you Bitcoin in the context of Hoffer's book. So as I was reading, I'm thinking, oh, there's MAGA, there's Antifa, there's Bitcoin, there's all these players. Now, the bit Bitcoiners in many ways are the fanatics. And 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 one of the things about revolutions is they're not powered by old guys. So it's not shocking that hodlers tend to be young. And it's you're a not, you're a natural hodler by this. You're emotionally. You're a yeah, I just you, don't own them. Yeah, that's no, right. not Bitcoin. Right. You've hodled everything else, though. That's right. So 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 someone once explained why do people buy lotto tickets when the math is so bad? And they said, if somebody has no chance, then to give them a minuscule chance is an improvement. And I hadn't thought of it in those terms. And so, uh, so hodlers tend to be popular with guys who are looking saying, look, my job's not going to pay me well. I'm not going to get rich working at the whatever, but Bitcoin can make me rich now. So, so, by definition, a revolution like Bitcoin is going to be fueled by youthful people. So the fact that it's a bunch of young punks squealing like crazy is actually quite rational. 
Now, here's the downside. It's the greenest group of investors I've ever seen. They don't understand market structure. They don't understand. I got in a Twitter spaces and a bunch of them showed up and I get along with them because I don't disrespect them, right? And I, I'm not going to pass judgment because I don't know the answer yet. And I could imagine a day where you guys come staggering off the battlefield, bruised and battered, but alive. And I go, okay, I'm buying Bitcoin now. But until I see that battle, I'm not in the game yet. I want to see the battle of the bastards. And I want to see you guys come off alive. And then I go, now Bitcoin has come to come of age. And I'm happy to give up whatever happens in between. I passed at Bitcoin at 10 bucks a, a coin. So, uh, you know, it was a long ways back. Um, but it's also the greenest group. And for example, they were saying, you know, why would in a recession, why would Bitcoin go down? Mm. And I'm going, everything goes down. Right. It's a credit crunch. I go, why would I sell my Bitcoin? I go, because you probably bought a fucking house with a big mortgage, but you want to sell your Bitcoin because they were making you rich. Right. So you took out the big mortgage and now all of a sudden there's this recession. And once the selling starts, your Bitcoin is now no longer back in this grand purchase years. And so now as it goes further down, you go, oh shit, oh shit. Oh, and then you sell. I said, that's how markets work. And then some guy will buy it cheap and it'll run back up. Unless the state jumps in and says, the game's over. And the young guys say, oh, they can't do that. And I go, you've never seen the long arm of the state work, have you? Tell Stalin he couldn't stop Bitcoin. Mm. Tell Mao he couldn't stop Bitcoin. They would just bury you. So, so, so Bitcoin has got to survive that. And when the big money guy showed up and I was just, oh, this is great. I go, the big money's weak hands. These guys will trade their fucking hamsters if they can make a profit off the trade. They're not strong arm, strong handed holders. These are guys who follow the mean stocks up and then back down again, right? So, so when some big guy goes into Bitcoin, it doesn't mean it's come of age. It means that now you've been thrown into the, the shark tank. Now you really have a brawl on your hands. And uh, the other thing that you and I both know is what? How many? How many? How many cryptos are there now? Oh, over twenty thousand. Right. So let's say there's twenty thousand. Crudely speaking, nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety-nine have to die. Mm -hmm. And and statistically, statistically, the most probable one to survive is Bitcoin. But being number one out of twenty thousand is going to require a lot of important things. And if all of a sudden one comes along that says, oh, that's actually the cool one. Then all of a sudden Bitcoin starts dropping, the cool one starts rising, and it says, I want to own the cool one, boom. Bitcoin's gone again, right? So the, the, there, need, there are going to be forks in the road, they're going to be critical forks. And you know this. And when I talk to rational hodlers, they know this. But there's a bunch of the, and I know you have laser eyes on your Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. That's in support. But there's some guys who, who I think walk around life with laser eyes. <laughs> They're going to probably get hurt. Right? This is not, this is the Wild West. Yeah. So I wish you well. I have a mixed emotion because if you guys really rock, it could push gold out. I have a feeling there's room for both of us. And I do know that uh, owning Bitcoin today was better than owning Facebook. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Dave, I've enjoyed this tremendously. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a Send me a link. A send yeah, me a I'll link. definitely send you a link. And don't log off. Turn the recording off and I'll tell you a little story um, once the recording's off. You got it. This has been so dope. Thank you so much. This episode with Professor Dave Collum on how nothing adds up anymore was sponsored by River Financial and CrowdHealth. Please show some love and make sure to support our awesome Bitcoin focused sponsors. Stack Sats, stay humble and stay laser focused out there. And thank you for listening. 
This is Cedric. Peace.